Hey, my name is Chris Brennan, and you're listening to the Astrology Podcast. In this episode, we're going to be looking at the astrological forecast for November of 2022. Joining me today are astrologers Austin Kopic and Patrick Watson. Hey, guys. Hey, hey. Hey. <laughs> we will come back and do some bigger introductions here in a few minutes. First, I want to show the planetary alignments calendar to give people a preview of what we're going to be talking about in this episode for the astrology of November. And then we'll go through and break it down and go into a deep dive about the astrology of next month uh, here in a few moments. So here is the planetary alignments for November. We head into the month um, coming off of just having an eclipse in the sign of Scorpio, a solar eclipse. And right away at the top of the month on November 8th, we get the other half of that, which is a lunar eclipse in the sign of Taurus that is conjunct the planet Uranus. So it's a pretty big second eclipse taking place here early in the month. Also early in the month, we have a bunch of planets transiting through Scorpio that then move into and square, move into activating the square between Saturn and Uranus in Aquarius and Taurus, which is still very active. In the second half of the month, all the planets start moving into Sagittarius, starting with Venus on the 16th, moving into Sagittarius, then Mercury the following day on the 17th. The sun moves into Sagittarius on the 22nd, and then we get our first lunation that is not an eclipse in a while, which is a Sagittarius new moon on the 23rd, when interestingly, the very same day, Jupiter stations, stations direct in the sign of Pisces. So those are some of the things that we're at least heading into the month with as we talk about the astrology of November. So, all right. So welcome. This is a special Halloween episode of the Astrology Podcast. Uh, joining us today is special guest co-host Patrick, the human ephemeris Watson. <laughs> thanks for thanks for joining us. I think that phrase might be trademarked by our other friend Nick Dagan Best, and you might cause a little bit of tension there. But uh, otherwise, I, uh, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure as always. And uh, yeah, I think um, I couldn't pull off Nick's look, but I can pull off uh, the human ephemeris. I am a little sad that we weren't able to use my. Uh, view of the month, <laughs> but uh, you know that's uh, pretty much that. So, and is this supposed um, to be like a sexy ephemeris costume, or I mean, I'm wearing it, so you know that's obviously. true. Fair, yeah. fair point. And in reality, I mean, aren't all ephemeris is sexy by default? Indeed, I think indeed. Most of us would say, uh, Austin, right. you've got you've brought back. The, I'm getting some nostalgia. The skeleton costume. Which you wore uh, eerily enough in the forecast for like December of 2019, just before we recorded our 2020 year ahead forecast back before the dark times, I believe, right? Yeah, yeah, it was the the beginning of the end, quite literally. Yeah, this is just this is actually just one of my my shirts that I like and wear commonly, but you know, sometimes <laughs> some people think it's a bit dramatic, but you know, at least I'm not stealing ephemeris valor. <laughs> that, that's true. Stolen ephemeris valor uh, hashtag. Um, well, that's brilliant. I I was going to dress up as Jack Skellington from the Nightmare Before Christmas, but uh, due to a loss of a friend this week, didn't feel like it. But I did put up some decorations in my background, including my Scorpio pumpkin and uh, a lovely spider who's been who's my new roommate in the back there. His name's Ptolemy. Ptolemy the friendly spider. Uh, so he's going to be joining us for this episode as we. Uh, are recording this just before Halloween, when so much heavy astrology is taking place right now in between eclipses, Mars stationing retrograde, Jupiter going back into Pisces, Saturn square Uranus, and all sorts of other stuff. So it's been a lot of stuff in the news. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of recap, I think, for the next 30 or 40 minutes of how the astrology has gone and checking in since the last time we did a forecast episode over a month ago now. Uh, then later in the episode, in the second hour, I think we're going to get to talking about the astrology of November. So if people want to jump ahead to just talking about the forecast, then you can find the timestamps on the YouTube version of this, this podcast episode. So um, why don't we do some recap? First things first is like eclipses. So we just had that Scorpio eclipse just a few days ago here in October. And it seems like there's just like tons of stuff popping off in different people's lives, especially people that have fixed signs rising, which are, you know, Taurus, Leo, Scorpio, and Aquarius. 
Um, but that combined with the Mars stationing retrograde and grinding over some of those mutable sign placements, it seems like a lot of people are, are getting hit right now. Patrick, you had a story recently about Katy Perry. Uh, yeah, so this was very recent, just in the past couple of days. Um, there's been a lot of uh, chatter on Twitter and concern about Katy Perry because there was a video taken of her very recently at a concert where she seemed to be having trouble keeping an eye open. Um, in the past, she's talked about this as her so-called wonk eye, um, but um, it's just interesting that this sort of seems to have come to light in this very kind of extreme way right at the solar eclipse. And of course, the sun, the moon are uh, have this ancient uh, association with the eyes and with vision. And so it's interesting that there was a solar eclipse um, in Katy Perry's first house of appearance where she has her natal sun and moon in Scorpio. Uh, and uh, she had this um, sort of unfortunate attention being brought to something involving her appearance and her, her, her eye and not being able to open. I forget which luminaries associated with each eye. It'd be interesting to see if it's actually the right eye um, that uh, would correspond to that luminary being eclipsed, but um, it, it is the right eye. Okay, so <laughs> that there we go. That's a kind of I just thought it was a very oddly literal manifestation of that uh, transit and very appropriate for the house that it happened in in Katy Perry's chart since she's a Scorpio rising. Yeah, for sure. And as soon as you started mentioning that, I got worried about this story because uh, Katy Perry, of course, famously is my time twin, and I, I feel like she's like one of my horror cruxes. So if like something happens to Katy Perry, Katy Perry goes down, then I know I'm next because I was born like two days later or just a few days later or something like Your that. Your astrological so, canary in the coal mine. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So I'm wishing her a speedy recovery uh, from eclipse season and hopefully, hopefully that can be fixed, whatever's going on there. Um, mm -hmm. Other major eclipse stuff going on, we had just in the past couple of days basically it sounds like elon musk has now officially bought twitter and this is coming like just after that scorpio eclipse as well um in addition to the mars retrograde in gemini with twitter itself um the very first tweet uh in twitter's like history which is like one of the first event charts for twitter also has mars and gemini squaring uh, a mercury uranus conjunction in pisces so we know that with Mars stationing now, it's going to back up and retrograde over that stuff. So interesting stuff going on there. Well, and it looks like Twitter, like that first tweet was between eclipses as well. That's right. Right. So it was just before or just after um, an eclipse, which would have been in Virgo and just before an eclipse that would have taken place in Aries, which so it's similar to where we're at now in terms of being in between eclipses. Yeah, that's What's interesting. I understand okay. now why I have such hostility towards Twitter in general. Twitter has its that first tweet has its Mars on the degree of my moon. Mm, okay. I, I know yeah. I'm not the only person who finds Twitter irritating, but uh that's that's not great sinistry. Yeah, I mean for a website that's about, you know, communication is probably not the best idea to have uh, Mercury in its fallen sign retrograde conjunct Uranus. You know, that's what give, makes it a an unending waterfall of um very interesting amusing and nonsensical stuff right it's not the optimal uh you know platform for nuanced discussions necessarily well, but uh entertaining nonetheless well, no that's interesting um because when when a topic is brought to twitter generally speaking the longer it's on twitter the more nuance it loses right like being in that chart um create like it, it literally um uh, uh reduces the magnification like things get blurrier and blurrier until you know it, it's sort of a, a two-dimensional not even not even a cartoon of the original positions and the actual debate hmm. yeah uh, the, the, the chart with the eyesight right it's literally between eclipses and with mercury and fall you know mercury one of the things about mercury and fall uh in pisces is that there's generally um things get blurrier and blurrier there's a there's a movement uh as we say there's generally movement further away there's that jupiterian trying to get the whole picture when instead and in getting making it bigger and bigger instead of magnifying to actually get the you know the actual mercurial data it's sort of like oh it's 
one, you know, set of numbers and words in a vast sea, and you know, you've lost, um, <laughs> uh, you, you've lost the data point, which is what Mercury is trying to do. Did uh, did the Twitter deal first emerge at the previous set of eclipses? I believe it did. So this yeah. is kind of a carryover then from those in initiating uh, set of circumstances. Yeah, and that yeah. Mercury retrograde, sorry, Chris, that Mercury retrograde went back and forth over the North Node in Taurus, the North Node being the eclipsing point. So even because uh, that story carried on for a while. And so even while the, you know, the dramatic part wasn't happening ne next to the eclipse, we were still right next to an eclipse point. And it was Mercury um, dawdling, spending extra time next to an eclipse point. And the, the yeah, hungry. And that the was one one of the initial issues with it was um that Elon Musk initially made major moves to buy Twitter but then when with the Mercury retrograde he tried to back out of the deal um but he's finally having to buy it this week cuz he was compelled by a judge because he had gone too far in committing to it so he, he couldn't get out of the deal basically at this point and then finally gave in and had to buy it this week the week of the eclipses it's interesting to think about the north node or dragon's head uh, association with devouring and hunger in the sort of uh, ecosystem of big capitalism, right? Because you have um, giant fish uh, devouring other giant fish, but slightly smaller. You know, like the 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 devouring via takeover. You know, it, it is in many ways like consuming, right? One company or entity um literally takes in and incorporates the uh the bot company into the body into its own body and may rip it apart right for nutrition or um may simply contain it mm, yeah mm. um well and, and the other thing is just this is another good indication or another good example like a real life example which is why we do these reviews of you know how sometimes eclipses can work in mundane astrology and can affect or or be relevant to large groups of people all at the same time because here we have like a, a handover a takeover of one of the largest social media companies in the world that um, influences so much contemporary discussion about art and politics and science and all all things like that handing over and, and now becoming under new management and then we'll see where that goes but one way or another it seems like it would affect a large group of people and it happened you know, so close to this eclipse. And so another thing that a related thing that the nodes are involved with historically and in the present is rise and fall, which is what the nodes literally indicate, right? Whether the moon is rising above uh, the plane of the ecliptic, rising above the, the sun's little golden line or, or plunging or what's the word swooping below. Um, and, you know, we have this association with eclipses and changes in the landscape of power, right? Um, you know, I, I, in that I, uh, the House of the Dragon um, season finale was, I don't know, 24 hours, 30 hours before the eclipse. I and mean, it had me thinking about dragons and the and rising and f the rise and fall of houses and people in power. Um, and often, you know, one one house or system or group devours another like you know the power is seized um and didn't we Watson, you were saying that we've we've had some interesting um changes in who who has power who is uh i believe you told me coron coronating was not a word um, <laughs> yeah coronating uh, is not a word crowning is the correct uh, verb uh the coronate is a uh, an improper verb derived from coronation but yeah you were, um, you were cr crowning a little bit out of that ephemeris just a little earlier in this episode. <laughs> yeah, 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 I just yeah. I decided to, to 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 take it off, but um, you know, I I, I do have a little pumpkin at least uh, right there. Um, <laughs> but uh, in any case, um, so yeah, one of the more probably like literal things that happened right on the day of the eclipse was that uh, the new prime minister of the UK was appointed by. Um, by King Charles III. It's weird. This thing is the first time I've uh, you said that uh, phrase, King Charles III. And um, so that's pretty crazy literal. If the sun is a natural sort of significator or ruler of, of leaders, kings, authorities, etc., that the uh, this handover and uh, leadership or of governance of the country happens on the day of a solar eclipse. And um, also interestingly is that the projected date of King Charles's coronation, the official coronation, will actually be on 
uh, the day after the next lunar eclipse in Scorpio next year. Um, so we have the Prime Minister of the UK being appointed on the day of a solar eclipse in Scorpio by the king who will be crowned uh, at the next lunar eclipse in Scorpio. And also on that same day, I believe, um, was the first date of the uh, new Italian uh, Prime Minister's uh, premiership as well. Mm. So, um, you know, it's not that every time there is an eclipse that you necessarily see, you know, terms beginning and ending, but it is interesting to see how when new leaders do emerge or when leaders, you know, recede, uh, that um, those things can happen around these important junctures of the sun and moon, you know, the, the relationship between the collective and its leaders. Um, so what's, what's wild it, it, also about Charles is um, he's Leo rising. So these eclipses are bouncing back and forth between his fourth house of like home and family and parents and his 10th house of career and reputation and overall life direction. And we get you know, the death of his mother, the queen, and then his then sudden ascension to finally becoming coming king after a lifetime sort of, of of waiting for it or expecting it. Wow. And he was also born during uh, an eclipse season across Taurus and Scorpio, right? Yeah. With the has, several- the, yeah, has the head of the dragon with the moon in Taurus natally, just like the eclipse that's less than two weeks away as we record one that comes on november 8th right and the new prime minister um i forget his name sunak sunak uh he uh was born with the sun in taurus so we know that he is also kind of implicated in uh this series of eclipses across that scorpio taurus axis as well yeah that's really interesting so like as you were saying there it's not that every time a leader is elected or chosen or seizes power that there is an eclipse to mark it but when eclipses do mark, um, uh, you know, uh, someone taking on a leadership or you know, royal role historically, um, that that's telling us something about the movement of power. That that they're not being eclipsed doesn't tell us, right? The, again, the eclipses seem to have to do with these slower, draconic currents of the the rise and fall of you know. I don't want to say movements, styles of leadership, vibe shifts, um, sea changes, whatever you want to call these, you know, sort of more zeitgeisty, invisible currents. Um, and so when those, you know, serpentine currents intersect with people taking or losing power, that's, how should we say, worth noting an mm-hmm. intersection. Without yeah. going too far off uh, the path, I'd also just want to remark very briefly that. Uh, there's there was this ancient Babylonian practice of substituting the king at a solar eclipse with a with a with a fake king, a substitute king, so that they would sort of take the brunt of the effect of a solar eclipse, and then the new king would sort of come in after that person was sacrificed or whatever. And so I just thought that was interesting how this almost plays out literally in the UK because Liz Truss was prime minister for uh, such a short amount of time; she was she almost served the role of being that substitute leader. Uh, leading up to the eclipse, and uh, there was even a bet made on Twitter that a, a you know a, a head of lettuce could last longer than Liz Truss, and the lettuce the lettuce won. Um, <laughs> the, the lettuce, you know, uh, almost became the new. Uh, she, she, it's almost like um, you know that uh, sort of describes the, uh, the significance of her time and the brief time she had in office was almost like. Um, you know, she was almost fulfilling that kind of Babylonian role of the substitute leader, right? Uh, so, so that the lettuce there. could survive to rule, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, right. So, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna have to get anyway. the AI program on that. So, I've gotten a real sense with these eclipses of like the disruptive quality of eclipses, and that's something you you're talking about and that you've talked about, Austin. That was really clear here. Um, one of the other big eclipse stories in the news. And it was broader than just the eclipse, but there was a real focal point on the eclipse was was everything happening with Kanye West. And he went on this just like bizarre, like two or three week tirade where he was saying all sorts of like really gross anti-Semitic stuff. Um, he was also getting into other stuff about saying like that George Floyd wasn't killed by the police officer that kneeled on his neck for eight minutes and lots of stuff like this. And eventually it got so bad that a bunch of companies suddenly started distancing themselves uh, from him because nobody wanted to be associated with somebody who's 
you know, bringing up like rhetoric from like the 1920s from like Nazis and stuff in terms of um, anti-Semitism. And it ended up really being a focal point the day and the night of the eclipse around October 25th, because there was a sudden switch where a bunch of the, the biggest companies that he was partnered with, like Adidas and Balenciaga and a bunch of other companies suddenly dropped him. And his net worth went from something like one or two billion dollars to like four hundred million dollars or something like that, practically overnight. And it happened to be the night of the eclipse. So there's a really wild, like, personal story there in terms of Kanye and eclipses and and other things like that. Yeah, well, and it, it, you know, um, with that again, the 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 eclipses are the points where the rising and falling of the moon relative to the sun becomes visible for a second, right? It's always happening. Like these currents of, of power and zeitgeistiness and all that. Um, it's always happening, but we only see it four days a year, right? It only becomes obvious during the moment of the eclipse. Um, mm -hmm. And it, uh, we spoke earlier about people taking on a role, um, but just as, yeah, <laughs> but in order for one to take on a role, another has to lose it. Right, and so falling is just as much um, is just as much part of the no the eclipse story as rising, and generally, and it's the tail right in our it's the tail side, uh, the south node side of the of the the eclipses that indicates the fall. It indicates indicates descending down below, and it's often it often feels like and looks like release, right? And so Kanye was released from all sorts of different contracts right and it's important not to like release i think is the is one of the best words for the south node but it's important to not assume that it's the it's always the positive feeling of like releasing your stress at the end of a of a long day it could be that you're dangling um over a cliff and the person who's holding the rope releases it right <laughs> it's it's just it's just release Right. I mean, um, this is the end of a long process with Kanye. I mean, there, there's been a lot of very concerning statements and behavior that he's exhibited over the past uh, couple of years. It seems to have gone, you know, much more extreme. And this seems to be sort of a definitive sort of turning point, seemingly. Uh, you know, people were upset with him before, but now it seems to be, you know, like reaching a point where people now have to, you know, really decide kind of what side they're on in some ways with, with uh, him. And uh, so it's it's uh, very eclipsing, yeah. Yeah, and it's very well. What's interesting um, is that Kanye has was it is it two or three planets in Taurus natally that are in the eclipse zone, but Kanye also has um, the Sun in Gemini, <clears throat> um, which Mars has just been going back or has gone over and is going to go back. Like he's having the longest Mars over, you know, back and forth over his sun transit he'll have for, I don't know, a very long time, maybe ever. And so, so you have that Mars 1990, uh, maybe. Yeah, right. This the is Mar an time chart, but I'll show the chart. But I just want to say it was on time before I show it. Keep going. Right. And the sun is associated with public appearance and also how a person is seen. Oh, so it's over his uh, sun and and Jupiter. Right. And there are mm -hmm. the three planets in Taurus. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know, Mars and Gemini, and especially Mars and Gemini retrograde is another huge part of the astrology this month and, and the next month and half of the next month. And on a very simple level, uh, Mars and a Mercury ruled sign um, attacks or causes scandal, uh, offense um, by words, right? It's literally right. say like saying, um, um, you know, uh, saying scandalous and hateful things is mar like classic Mars and Gemini. I also think it's interesting, you know, you, I think it's been brought up here on the podcast before that Jupiter conjunct Neptune could be associated with the proliferation of like conspiracy theories, the expansion of the imaginary and the nonsensical. And so Kanye was born not just at a Jupiter Neptune opposition, but also when the sun was aligned with Jupiter opposite Neptune. And so it's interesting that, you know, we're still in this period of time when Jupiter is conjunct Neptune. So it's sort of, he's, Kind of, I would imagine a Jupiter Neptune opposition type person would be sensitive to a transiting Jupiter Neptune uh, conjunction, and as Jupiter moves into Pisces, it's going to be you know closer and, and co-present with Neptune for a little bit longer. So, um, yeah. I think that's kind I of mean, another dimension we could. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, I mean, well, I, I, I was sort of issues and discussions here that people have brought up about just it being this weird combination of like mental health issues of being unchecked egotism and stuff that that he's always had that's been there but used to be somewhat charming but now it's like run away because there's nobody around him that can sort of tell him he needs to stop or or check himself um that there's issues with uh yeah so it's just like a wide variety of a bunch of different things right i mean and now the the political swing that he's been through but then also evidently getting sucked into conspiracy theories to the extent of going to some of the darker corners of the conspiracy theory realm, which is where you get into anti-Semitism and, and lots of other stuff like that. So um, yeah, there's been a longstanding thing about his birth time and like one, me wondering and trying to figure out his birth time for years and investigating that. I've been leaning towards recently, like the Leah Rising chart at this point as like understanding things. I haven't done the full workup that I'd like to if I was actually trying to seriously rectify his chart. but. That's one of the things that I've been provisionally looking at, especially with these eclipses taking place now between Scorpio and Taurus, if that would be hitting his fourth, 10th house axis and just having this dramatic sudden fall from he had achieved everything he ever wanted to achieve. He'd become a billionaire. He'd become not just a, a, a artist, a, a musician, one of the most respected musicians of our generation. He actually achieved his side goal, which is becoming one of the most influential designers uh, and clothing designers of a generation. And then he uh, pretty much threw it all away basically over the course of the past few weeks, um, as well as other things like his marriage over the past couple of years, which might be related to Saturn going through Aquarius, which would be his seventh house in if the Leo rising chart was true. Right. Um, yeah. So I don't know if that's necessarily the correct chart. I'm not going to die trying to defend that rectification, but um, rectification is one of the things that's kind of interesting. Sometimes when it comes to celebrity charts, they're untimed and astrologers are always trying to look at events and then compare them to different possible charts to see if they can infer the right one. Um, and that's something Patrick and I have been doing a lot because we finally launched our rectification course this month after like a year and a half of working on it. Yeah, very happy to have announce that that uh that the course is is live um it's 22 hours of video it's uh all uh sort of more reliable uh techniques uh that we sort of put to the test in uh client uh case studies and uh, uh discussions with uh clients live sessions and uh, uh it's it's basically us just um really explaining our approach to rectification and uh, our successes with it, and in some cases our difficulties with it. Uh, so it's I I would think it would be very helpful to anyone who is looking for a place to start with how to rectify a chart, whether you know the birth time approximately or whether you're starting from a 24 hour time frame without knowledge of the rising sign. Yeah, just because there's so many newer students of astrology that need to rectify charts, either because they don't know their birth time or they only have an approximate time, or maybe their ascendant is on the cusp of two signs, but they don't have like a methodology for how to approach that, which is always a challenge early on. But teaching people like a standard method they can apply consistently to charts to rectify them is what we try to do in the course. So if people can find out more information about that at theastrologyschool.com and just look up the birth time rectification course. All right. It's so really nice to have a system to run through rather, you know, because when you're faced with a chart that needs to be rectified, it's sort of, you know, it, it's very easy to start, start with just suspicion and intuition and hope and fear, but having a, like a battery of techniques to run through and see what it looks like when you look at it from the point of X, Y, Z, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's really valuable. Yeah. And it's, it's one yeah. of the skills that every astrologer has to learn because you're going to run into that as an issue in different contexts of needing to rectify different charts for whether it's clients, whether it's family members, whether it's celebrities or what have you. So that it becomes one of those like necessary skills that we all learn at some point. All right. So that's rectification. A little bit of their recap of news. Um, earlier in the month of October, Biden pardoned a bunch of federal marijuana convictions and made some issued some different legal things related to starting to legalize marijuana or moving in that direction by de uh, 
rescheduling it. This happened around October 6th, which I was really interested by because Mercury, it was just coming out of Mercury stationing direct opposite Neptune. And I thought, what a perfect like archetypal you know, symbolism of, of tr- the, uh, sort of attempting to legalize or taking steps towards legalizing marijuana under a, a Mercury Neptune opposition, but with like Mercury moving direct, you know, like moving forward on something that's like a Mercury Neptune opposition rather than retrograde or, or what have you. For sure. Yeah. That's sort of, you know, with Mercury, you know, there's a certainty. Um, with Mercury direct in Virgo, there's an attempt to get certainty and clarity. And with Neptune, it's sort of like, no, we're, we definitely don't care. This is definitely not that big a deal. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And so, instead of like, we, you know, we need to do a lot more analysis, it's like, no, we don't like this just isn't, this isn't a big deal. In terms of like, no longer the stigma surrounding marijuana and like people not prohibition against it no longer being fashionable. Yeah. Well, you know, if you, if you think Mercury's normal move, especially in Virgo, is to, analyze and uh, organize right and to arrange very carefully and with and neptune neptune generally gets in the way of that because neptune's like oh who cares right it's all one it's all one world it's all you know it's just you know neptune is so big that it ruins any attempt at detail but in this case it it makes sense it's like ah, oh, moving on right like we don't like this eh, who cares you know go smoke your pot kids forgiveness also tends to be a uh signification uh, associated with nept with uh jupiter and jupiter is mm-hmm. although it wasn't exactly in, in uh conjunction it's still sort of within range and even as jupiter was moving up to conjoin neptune earlier this year there was the um you know there was the attempt to like legalize marijuana on a federal level so it's um i sort of see it as part of that as well and maybe that mercury you know, transit was sort of like a trigger for this broader movement for acceptance and em- embrace of uh, marijuana and other sort of hallucinogenics or recreational drugs. Yeah, which is really a big part of that's that's the it's the 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 smiley face part of Neptune and Pisces. Um, is there's been there have been huge strides. Um, if we look at 2011, 2012, when Neptune entered Pisces. Since then, you know, I live in Oregon, and so there's just, you know, there's a marijuana shop. Um, is, there are many, um, there are as many marijuana shops as there are gas stations. Um, and I lived in California before that, and it was the same there. So my, you know, and Chris, you're in Colorado. My my view is, um, I should say, um, localized, but, um, you know, there's been a huge acceptance. There's been a huge, uh, a huge gain in acceptance in the decriminalization. And uh, of a lot of psychedelics, as well as their acceptance as um, you know, their provisional acceptance uh, as useful in treating a variety of mental conditions, and then the the corresponding uh, you know dark twin here, the dark fish with Pisces, um, <clears throat> the, the the shark, the one with teeth, is that we've also seen. Um, the rates of opioid abuse and overdose overdose just skyrocket in exactly the same time frame. You know, it's very uh, speaking as a sun in Pisces. You know that that is sort of the two, um, the two different sort of <laughs> uh, the the two fish. One um, one would just like to kill the pain, and the other wants to expand awareness to cosmic levels. The guppy and the shark. Yeah. Yeah, or the yeah, whatever the. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the uh, <laughs> the the acid head and the fentanyl addict inside the, uh, every Pisces lives. <laughs> yeah, the tendency. There are two towards, fish like, inside you. Um, yeah, yeah. tendency towards escapism is is a definitely like a Pisces Pisces quality. I think that's remarked on pretty frequently. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, all right, and then one other news story, Patrick. You had about the um, asteroid, the Dart uh, mission. Yeah, so basically we wanted to test and see if we could change the orbit of a planetary body. Say if there was a media that was coming to Earth, you know, would we be able to pull off a Bruce Willis and actually change the trajectory of uh of a media? And so the answer to that is actually yes, we can do that. Um so on in, on October 11th NASA confirmed that after we rammed a rocket into 
this small asteroid, we were able to shorten its orbit by 32 minutes. So this is actually pretty huge because this means that we might actually be able to save ourselves if we're faced with this situation in theor theory and now in practice, it is possible. So in some ways, this is very hopeful, but it's really interesting from an astrological perspective because I'm not really an asteroid guy uh, most of the time. But in this case, we're actually dealing with a literal asteroid. In this case, we're talking about asteroid 65803, um, which if you look it up, it's actually going to be called Dimorphos. But the at the asteroid they hit was actually the satellite of Dimorphos, which is uh, Didymos or Didymos. I don't actually know how to pronounce it. Um, so uh, we we launched this rocket at Didymos <laughs> on November 24th, 2021. And uh, that actually happens to be when that asteroid was conjunct Mars. So we <laughs> launched a rocket and called it DART as we, uh, you know, sent it to to destroy this uh, or, you know, to crash into this uh, asteroid. And of course, at the time of impact, that was when the asteroid was closest to Earth. Um, and that's actually the entire reason that it was launched on November 24th, 2021 was because that would match up that would make that would allow us to be able to strike it when it was closest to earth so it's so the one of the few cases where astronomers and scientists are looking at the positions of planets to plan something that they want to do you could call it electional astronomy um and uh so it's so remarkable that september 26 2022 was always going to be the day that we were going to hit it because that's when it's closest to earth but it just so happened that the moment we decided to launch was when the asteroid was conjunct Mars. And if, even from a heliocentric perspective, um, the asteroid itself was aligned with the Saturn-Uranus square uh, pretty tightly as well. And if we think of what that is, right, we <laughs> launched a rocket into space to smash into this uh, hard body. So it's, uh, I think, quite a, an amazingly literal and uh, amazing demonstration of how these... Uh, synchronicities seem to yeah, make a lot of sense you know for what happened yeah that's I'll great add that to the list of like cute asteroid um historical things uh mars being conjunct this asteroid at the launch of a mission to hurl a rocket at it <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there ast you go. asteroid dartboard yeah right all right so that's good for news stories um there was only one other big news story, which was um, the Russian mobilization, which was huge, and the pipeline attack um, in connection with that, which I know you, you, one of you wanted to mention in connection with a specific square. So the gas line attack uh, on uh, Nord Stream, which is the gas lines which connect uh, Russia supplying gas to Europe, um, that was attacked during the Mercury retrograde. And that happened as Mars was moving into a square with Neptune. So if you think of the archetypal combination of Mars and Neptune, you can draw an association between explosions, of which there was one, on gas lines under the ocean. So uh, it's quite um, an appropriate signature for something like this to happen under a Mars-Neptune square across those signs. And we know that because Mars goes retrograde, it will hit um, a square to Neptune again, and then when it goes direct, then Mars will hit another square to Neptune again. So, you know, it's something to keep in mind as this next squares happen. That this is one of the things that has come about from that is the um, destruction or attacks on pipelines and gas reserves. Yeah, and just to go back to the simple but important fact that this is Mars operating in Mercury's territory. Uh, we also saw over the last month an escalation in the destruction of other civil infrastructure um bridges and such during uh you know with mars and gemini and you know gemini is the roads uh, bridges and pipelines and you know um uh, that which is necessary to carry power and people and goods from one place to another right energy infrastructure they and that this is, you know, this is Mars and Gemini, um, and that that correlates with um, the phase that Mars is in, which is coming up on the retrograde. By the time those of you who aren't here live with us listen to this, Mars will probably be retrograde. 
Um, and during the Mar the, during the retrograde, the Mars's retrograde um, phase, when it occurs in the midst of an ongoing war, uh, you uh, historically you have the how should we say the destruction um, tending to go out of the bounds that it was in before, right? Where more and one way that looks is civilian infrastructure gets destroyed. Um, it's less, um, you know, the the spectators uh, start getting. Uh, start being part of the violence like you know there, there's an expansion of the scope is it generally um as i say both sides tend to lose control as thing, things get a little bit the mars in general gets a gets out of control more during mars retrogrades and that's um true in a personal level it's you can see that in nativities but then that's also true in, in conflicts themselves and i i had i just had a one observation about Mars's phase and the the tides, um, the general tides of the the Russo-Ukrainian war, um, and that is that we had um, we had last month, or was it? Well, it was at the very end of September. It sort of consolidated in October, but we had sort of high tide for the Ukrainian take back of lands that were um, conquered months and months earlier, um, and with the successful offensive in the northeast. Um, and so that's sort of the high water mark, uh, in a sense. And then more, and nothing more has happened um, in terms of significant territory trading since then. We have Mars, uh, and when that occurred, we spoke last month about how well that's you know that's great for the Ukrainians, but Mars is going to come back two more times through there. And one of the uh, Chris, as you mentioned, one of the big stories, um, uh, one of the many big stories uh, during October was the. Uh, the the Russian call up re of reserves and enactment of a draft, um, and so you know we knew we knew that Mars would have to come back, right? And so now we see, okay, the Russia is literally preparing um, and calling up troops in order to do the next wave, um, which will sadly inevitably happen over the you know sometime over this month or the next month. But you have that like. You know, I was thinking about Mar when Mars draws back. Sometimes it's you know it's uh, uh, drawing back a bow, right? Um, it's pulling back the tension that will be inevitably released, right? Because it's not just permanently backwards; it's um, forward, back, and then forward again. And so you can see that very clearly in the the as I said, the tides of the war. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so as we head into this phase of things with the Mars retrograde beginning in earnest at this point at the very end of October and early November. Um, all right, so that's it for news stories. The only other brief thing I wanted and needed to mention is like a, about a week ago now, um, an astrologer and a friend of mine named Kirk Kahn passed away. And I wanted to mention it because he was uh, when I was president of the Association for Young Astrologers, he was the vice president. Um, so Kirk was an astrologer that I met at Kepler College when we were both in our early 20s. And um, yeah, we ran the Association for Young Astro Astrologers together. He was one of the first younger astrologers that I met because one of the things that people these these days don't understand the younger generations is like there's so many young astrologers in the field that people sort of assume it's always like that but back at this point in the mid 2000s you know you could count the number of young astrologers that you'd met on one hand basically for a period of time I don't, if you remember that Austin yeah I'm, I'm thinking of a particular Norwalk maybe it was 2008 and I think as far as under 40s I think that it was you, me, Kate, and maybe one or two other people, uh, people who are under 40 at that time who are attending. Right. Yeah. So, you know, I was really rare and I was really excited to meet Kirk at Kepler. And we were the same age because we were both born in 1984. Um, but we ended up getting involved in community organizing and organized the Association for Young Astrologers together. And I think we were like the maybe third or fourth in a series of, of, leaders of the association for young astrologers and then austin you took over from us after we left um and kirk and i uh, organized and focused on getting young astrologers to conferences and doing scholarships and room shares and that was our main thing for trying to integrate some of the younger astrologers that were coming into the field with the established community just because the younger astrologers tended to not have 
as much money as was necessary to attend these expensive conferences. So getting them there was was part of our mission, and we did a pretty good job of that. Um, I have a picture. We even organized like the premiere of the Return of the Magi movie at the United Astrology Conference in 2008. And I have this old picture of me, Kirk, and Meredith Garston, who also worked with us at AYA. At, that was like an AYA event that we organized with over like a thousand astrologers to premiere that that documentary on astrology. So it's probably one of the high points of our sort of career doing all of that stuff together. Um, Kirk also was one of the first astrologers in the country who started a meetup on astrology. So he started uh, the New York City Astrology Meetup, and he was one of the first astrologers to see the potential of, of the meetup.com website and to use it. And then other astrologers like myself, after attending some of Kirk's meetups where he hosted speakers and had a lot of astrologers attending talks, um, other astrologers would emulate that and so set up some of their own meetup groups around the country until we get to today where meetup is kind of ubiquitous you know, all, the, all over the world in terms of using that to organize astrology groups. But Kirk was really one of, if not the first, and for a period of time had the largest astrology meetup in, in the country or in the world. Um, he also ran the popular Planet Watcher website, which tracked different transits and things things like that. But um, anyway, he um, struggled with some mental health issues for years, the past few years. Um, but during his short life, he did a lot of stuff and I think touched a lot of people. So there was a memorial for him last weekend. And I think there's going to be another memorial that I just heard about around November 20th that Demetrius Bagley is organizing for some people to say some words about him. So um, I'll post a link to that at some point once I get more information. Yeah. So, um, all right. So a lot of heavy astrology right now. And that's one of the things, you know, we mixed in some funny stories from the news with some heavy stories, but there's a lot of heavy astrology going on right now. And we have to be kind of, you know, real about that with people. Cause I know a lot of people are getting hit in different ways with some really serious and major changes um, in their lives at different points. And, and we've seen some of that in some of the, the news stories that we've talked about, but I'm sure there's just countless other stories. So that's one of the things we'll have to understand as we move into talking about the astrology of of November is just uh, how heavy you know this period of time is right now. Yeah. I mean you have both malefics like stationing, right? Like with you know within a week of it. I mean it's insane how much has been is happening in this like two week period between the end of October and the start of November. So it's um yeah it's it's the, the only way to, to describe it is just pretty heavy. Yeah. As the last part of the recap, why don't we just um, state some of that stuff, like state where we are with the astrology that's just happened at this point, because this episode will probably come out on the 30th or 31st. So a bunch of stuff will have just happened. Um, why don't we very briefly just mention a little bit of it um, at the end of this recap before we jump into November. So we just had Saturn stationing direct in the sign of Aquarius on the 23rd of October. So now Saturn is beginning its final run through the second half of Aquarius before it um, ends that run and, and completes its three-year journey through Aquarius. And that Saturn station um, also was reactivating the very close Saturn-Uranus square, which we're coming out of that being the closest that it's going to get that aspect and completing that, you know, two-year run at this point, almost three-year run of Saturn squaring Uranus back and forth uh, since 2020 and 2021. Um, some of the other astrology that's been happening over the past week, as we already mentioned, is the eclipse that occurred in Scorpio. But there was also a Sun Venus Kazemi that happened in the sign of Libra. And we're going to talk about a little bit later how that was actually much more notable than it might seem at first, because it was a major century-long shift away from those conjunctions happening in the sign of Scorpio. Um, then finally, Jupiter just returned to Pisces, or will return to Pisces tomorrow on Friday the 28th. And finally, Mars stations retrograde on October 30th, uh, right there at the end of Gemini. So it's just like a ton of heavy stuff like all happening right now. During this one-week time frame, and we can already see some evidence of that through major changes happening 
in the world or in the lives of celebrities and stuff in the sort of macrocosm, but in the microcosm, a lot of big changes happening in people's individual lives at the same time. Yeah, it's a really nice review. I, I would just add one thing is that so as you said, we've been we've been doing the Saturn Uranus square um all this year, all last year, and then we got a, a strong taste in in the second quarter of 2020. And very consistently the the dramatic points uh in that square, which has as its general qualities, um, this um, shaking and destabilizing of uh, of systems, pressure testing them, um, and which has produced consistently um, extremely high volatility around um, what uh, finance people might call commodities, um, but are often just the basics of life because Uranus is in Taurus, basic things like food, and energy. Um, the <clears throat> Uranus has also been Uranus and Taurus. It's also been very concerned with um, currency and money, which is another basic thing, right? We all deal with food, energy, and money every day. Um, you know, with various the rise and fall of currencies and crypto. This and is this the future? Is this a pipe dream? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so there are most dramatic points. Um, with all these things, oh, Saturn Uranus also likes to create civil unrest for any and all reasons, uh, for any and all sides in conflicts. But our dramatic points have been when Mars or the eclipses have joined um, Saturn or Uranus. And so what we are doing this month is really the last hurrah um, of the Saturn Uranus square. This is the Saturn Uranus square with the eclipses uh, lighting them up. Um, they're on the same fixed axis and the lunar eclipse, which takes place on November 8th, is right next to Uranus and therefore square Mars. And so the, the eclipses, which happen to be happening now, or we're in, in between them right now, um, are the last um, sort of huge exclamation point for this uh, Saturn Uranus cycle, which has been going for longer. And you know, by the time the next eclipses arrive, this it won't be Saturn square Uranus. It'll be a different arrangement. Saturn will have moved on into Pisces and be co-present with Neptune for years and years. Different vibe. Yeah, and it's really been striking how much you know, starting back in April and May. That we saw the eclipses starting to happen in in Scorpio and Taurus, how much they really supercharged and activated the Saturn Uranus square that was already present for the past year or two, um, and we started seeing, for example, um, the economy starting to get destabilized um, after those eclipses in April and May, and then now that we're getting to the next set of those same eclipses, starting to see similar things where. Um, I think, for example, there was an inflation report that came out just a few weeks ago that showed that inflation wasn't as under control as they thought or expected at this point. And so they're projecting, I think, that like the Fed will have to raise the interest rate again in November, right around the time of these eclipses, which then um, you know, will cause further instability in terms of the economy. Um, but the alternative of just letting inflation run away is an even worse option. But it's striking that earlier this year, one of the main signatures we talked about with inflation was the Jupiter-Neptune conjunction in Pisces. And then this month, Jupiter is retrograding back into Pisces where it will be with Neptune. And I wonder if you know inflation and, and attempts to control it and, and things like that won't continue to be one of the main focuses at this time. Yeah. it's uh, So two things. One, um, it's not just the economy of the United States. They, you know, from uh, from the sources that I have uh, investigated, um, economists are looking at whether the eurozone will have a mild, severe, or apocalyptic recession. Um, that I believe the the video I watched gave a sixty five percent chance to severe. Um, and you know, we all know uh, we're all aware of what feeds into that. Um, but it, you know, it's not just the U.S. and China has not been having a great time either. Um, Sorry, what was my second point? I'm sorry. Um, was it maybe Mars squaring Jupiter? Yes, yeah, thank you. The popping yeah. of things. I know that's okay. yeah, something yeah, that it, you it, talked about in the year ahead forecast was the Mars squaring Jupiter as being a new component at, at this point in the year. 
Yeah, the, so we have a Jupiter's return to Pisces and therefore a resumption of some of that Jupiter Neptune energy, which um, I, I'll just speak on be speak on behalf of the positive potentials for just a second because we've only characterized it as um, you know a descent into the uh, 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 dangerous delusion. Mm-hmm. It can be it's wonderfully imaginative. Um, it's just it's it's dangerously imaginative. Um, where if imagination, (laughs) when imagination eclipses reality, um, you have a lot of problems. And so, uh, the Jupiter Neptune is big on, uh, economically looks like inflation. It looks like an inflation. It it looks like inflation. It also looks like the overvaluation of things, right? The imagining that something's going to be very valuable or successful, rational exuberance is, um, yeah, is right like have, yeah, yeah or sometimes just the result of good marketing right or or hope um which of course is um, opium yeah to when, borrow when the, you have to borrow the phrase from lisa shine um i i don't think lisa, lisa made that up i oh, heard that okay. like 10 years ago uh, <laughs> okay. love lisa no no shade um but um but anyway um so we have jupiter and neptune you know, let's say uh, capable of bubble generation and then what can what pops bubbles more than you know sharp bladed mars and so actually in the yearly we talked about uh we talked about what bubbles remain by the end of the year being popped by mars's consistent square uh to neptune and therefore to that jupiter neptune energy it's it's a bubble inflating energy but there's a needle right there Right. And we maybe one of the one of those needles that we already know is there is the plan to uh, to raise rates. There may be I imagine there will also be some uh, 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 some some fond dreams that um, also implode. I was uh, thinking I was looking the other day at, at how um, Facebook's meta project is doing, um, and it appears to be one of the most expensive failures in history which um is certainly a jupiter neptune oh we're all just going to live in the jupiter world and not or not jupiter world uh the imagine the neptunian uh virtual world and not get headaches and want to vomit um but that that's one example but there there could be many and i I would say that this is an excellent test for jupiter neptune dreams the ones that survive this have a place right this is uh this is quite the uh if your bubble if your bubble is strong enough that it doesn't pop when there are when a, a nail bomb goes off next to it that says something about the uh uh the resiliency of that vision mm. Mm. yeah those are some really good visuals patrick uh well you know it's to to, uh, to i guess uh, to add a almost almost a counterpoint um i think uh in some of ray merriman's books ray merriman is a probably one of the most well-known financial astrologers out there. He, uh, in his study of Mars retrogrades, he said this, that the um, motion of the market tends to go up during those periods. Uh, it's not impossible, I suppose, to say that uh, Jupiter's entrance back into Pisces uh, might prolong a sense of hope, unreasonable, because I think what, I mean, usually, I mean, I guess I can't, I'm not really in a position to say, but I, I, my observation is that like crashes and stuff tend to happen when people have um basically uh when be- people basically assume that like nothing can go wrong you know because we've already been sort of coming down from uh a high in the, at least like the general market like the s p right and let me add one thing um the pop started when mars conjoined jupiter and neptune uh earlier in the year all right okay the there you go so you have all right that's good then you have like uh yeah something to to back it up um right so i, I, I would expect uh is i guess the only thing that doesn't quite make sense is it almost seems like um everyone's expecting something and it's it seems like these crash events happen once uh you know the last bear has been been flipped to a bull you know then then that seems to be like when things sort of go down so i i wouldn't necessarily bank on it uh uh getting um uh i mean it could always get worse i suppose but uh i i i sort of am hedging my bets i guess with the idea that like it will be this particular period where things go down we can also see if we like track some of the eclipses that have occurred during like previous uh seasons that 
you know, there are also eclipses going into next year as well that like mirror things that happened in 1987, which led to a big crash. So, um, uh, just in case someone's watching this and thinks like we're projecting like the crash will happen now, uh, I, I, I'm not so sure. There seems like there's some conflicting indicators potentially, but yeah, I, the, but I, I love I, the symbolism I, of the bubble yeah, being popped. Think, and that is interesting that the Mars Jupiter conjunction was kind of the beginning of the slide. Right. Well, and you know, this is what you're what you're saying is what people try to do all the time, which is calling the bottom, right? Figuring out um, is there anything left to to pop in the environment? Obviously, there have been a number of there, there was a a whole kettle of popcorn earlier in the year, right? But figuring out <clears throat> when you have which is where you have what is literally like a nodal bending, right? It's the south the south bending when the way down becomes the way up. Right when you hit the floor, and then um, things can only go up from there. Um, this doesn't, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I, I uh, yeah. Uh, again, we're not um, we're not giving financial advice, but we are yeah, speculating. Right. We are speculating yeah. on the patterns. <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah. I would My, say uh, what what what's left to pop will certainly have an ordeal this month. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, my main question is just if it's true that Jupiter-Neptune conjunction in Pisces earlier this year did coincide with the issues with inflation, which it seemed to and symbolically made sense and, and many astrologers anticipated that, then I just wonder if Jupiter-Neptune coming back over the next couple of months isn't um, a return to some of those issues and uh, the people in charge struggling to address and fix those issues and maybe things um, you know, being more not handled than they thought they were previously, which is basically what they're already finding out. But um, I think we should start to see the full development of that story, especially once we get the Jupiter station um, later in November around the time of our second lunation, which is the Sagittarius new moon that takes place on the 23rd, the same day that Jupiter stations direct in Pisces. Um, yeah. So- mm -hmm. All right. I want to pause for a minute because one of the things I wanted to mention this month is we have a couple of sponsors that are relevant for talking about astrology and astrologers um, and different things that are coming up. One of which, um, probably the most important of which, is the Northwest Astrology Conference, which has just announced their next astrology conference is going to take place in May 25th through the 29th, 2023 in Tukwila, Washington, which is just outside of Seattle. And they've just opened registration, announced speakers, uh, lecture topics, as well as workshops. Looking at the list of speakers, I see your I see your name on there, Austin. Are you speaking at this conference? Yes, yes, I am. It's not a it's not a typo. <laughs> not a typo. <laughs> yeah, I'm going right. to be giving two lectures, and I also have um, I will also be doing a pre conference workshop. I believe on the the Thursday preceding the weekend. Okay. Brilliant. Um, well, Norwak, of course, is uh, you know me and Austin's first conference. It's most astrologers' first conference, and it's one of the most consistent ones because they've been doing this for over thirty years. Um, but they're constantly innovating, and one of the things that's interesting about this conference is that for the first time ever, you can either attend in person like normal, or you can attend virtually online. So for the first time, they're going to do a hybrid conference where you can attend in person or online, which is pretty big. They've been working up to that over the past couple of years, but that's kind of a turning point in terms of the the community, I think, right? Definitely. I, I mean, I, that means I, I can go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that means you can attend. So they haven't increased their prices in the past two years. Um, buying a ticket gives you free access to the lecture videos for two weeks afterwards. One of the things that you should know is that in-person space is limited and they actually sold out last year so that people weren't able to get into the in-person conference. So if you do want to attend the conference in person, it's a good idea to get your tickets now uh, before they sell out because there's a pretty good likelihood that they will sell out again. Um, they also have bundles for all lecture audio for $125 um, for all full conference attendees. They've got different packages and deals in terms of buying the recordings and stuff. Because that's one of the only, always one of the most tricky parts is having you know five or six different lectures going at once and having to pick between them and they kind of solve that issue by giving you access to the recordings afterwards so you don't have to pick. It's picking like a conference lecture is sometimes like picking your favorite child or something like that. <laughs> Sophie's choice. 
Right. So um, you can find out more information about that at norwac.net. Um, and yeah, shout out to them. And that should be a really amazing conference. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, it'll be fun. I'm really excited about all my lectures, but one in particular I have, um, it's true, true crime meets Abu Mushar. Um, mm -hmm. it's looking at the lot of the father and the lot of the death of the father in the Menendez brothers charts. Um, and it actually just lights up the whole story, the whole lurid affair. Okay. Well, that should be, that should be well attended. I, there's been a whole like a uh, string of, of interest and in, like, you know, things like that with that Netflix series on Dahmer and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, I, um, we're, we're, we're uh, what was it? One of you was saying that some of these events are having their, their Saturn returns. I think the Menendez brothers is Saturn and Aquarius. Um, I think that was mm. early nineties off the top of my head. Um, okay. but when was Dahmer? Um, is Dahmer's uh, or Dahmer's crimes having their Saturn return? Yeah, I haven't, I haven't been, uh, I haven't uh, looked into that. I, but in know. any case, I am looking forward to seeing that uh, presentation virtually. Yeah, uh, thank you. So, <laughs> so, so you, yeah, you're one of those people, Patrick, where we always wish we could get you to conferences, and you, you're not often not able to attend due to like family obligations and stuff. But being able to attend online means you actually will be there, right? Well, the difficult, the the I mean, for the past before, basically, I became a full time astrologer. The biggest obstacle was that I wasn't able to get out of work because I was working mm -hmm. as a teacher, and it often happened right at this like crucial time at the end of the year where I had a lot of obligations to uphold. So, and then I was resistant to go in recent years as well because of the pandemic and um, uh, just being really wary about in person um, uh, attendance. And so, uh, this is this is really great that uh, there's going to be this option for me to uh, to have uh, to to be in attendance. No yeah, way. and I, I think that's part of the reason why Laura is pushing for this because there are a lot of people that are, for example, like immunocompromised or other things like that that don't feel you know comfortably being able to attend events yet this close to either at whatever stage we're at with COVID and everything else. But um, I think making it more accessible and the push for accessibility in the astrological community has been one of the major things, and Norwalk's been one of the leaders in that over the past few years. So it's pretty awesome seeing. The community like evolving and changing right before our eyes in terms of conferences. I even saw something like that last weekend. There was a online conference that a bunch of up and coming astrologers uh, organized called Kazimi Con with a bunch of impressive lectures by a bunch of up and coming astrologers that was streamed live through Twitter Spaces for free. So that was super cool to see last week, and it's interesting seeing. In the same way that we were, you know, Kirk and I were innovating ten years ago with Aya to the best we could by trying to integrate the younger and older generations, you can see different move movements towards that now in 2022 as well. Yeah. Yeah. I like the hybrid too. I don't like replacing the real world with um, the virtual one, but I think the, the extending of the, of the real world with the virtual is nice. Oh, oh we're going to have VR conferences at some point, oh, yeah. my friend, and you're, you are going to be given lectures at those uh at some point we I, I, I will get i will give one and complain and not do it again <laughs> what if what if we give you like an avatar that's entirely like skull and bones like if you would you wear a skeleton avatar would that sell it for you no no i'm gonna, I'm gonna need I'm, I'm gonna need more than that <laughs> but let, we'll, let the, we'll let the uh, negotiations begin yeah so nor whack is not whack that's that's that should be the oh. the, the motto that <laughs> That's like that's a awesome. like a eighties PSA. <laughs> yeah, Patrick, you need to start an astrological like sales company, like Mad Men, like a advertising company for a little kitschy uh, statements like that. All right, um, it'll be on a t shirt in two years. Yeah. Quickly, I want to mention our <laughs> other sponsor, which is our friends at the Honeycomb Collective Personal Astrological Almanacs and Calendars, which are available at honeycomb.co. Um, so Honeycomb has been this amazing company that's come up in the past few years that builds custom-built calendars and almanacs that are based on your natal chart and your favorite house system. So it's no longer the days of back when you had to buy just a single almanac that would be set for some time zone that's not even your time zone and is not related at all to your natal chart. These are actually uh, custom printed for each person when you order them based on your exact time and date of birth. 
So Honeycomb tracks your natal transits alongside mundane transits, so you can write your own personalized forecasts. Um, and the thing about Honeycomb also is that you can get custom plugins in order to add things like uh, Zodiac releasing. Um, you can do personalized artwork from different community artists, and you can also um, customize the ephemeris and a number of other things like that. There's the Zodiac releasing visualizations um, that they have that I love with that Zodiac releasing plugin. Um, it also has other plugins like doing your bonification and maltreatment and other things like that with lunation charts and so on and so forth. So the prices for printed wall calendars start at $33 and almanacs start at $25. There's also digital versions starting at $10 which arrive by email in just 24 hours. So each of the printed Honeycomb products are made to order. So uh, if you want to get one in time for the holidays, then you should purchase the printed items soon by the end of November, and you'll get it before Christmas comes around. And I know that's like a popular gift sometimes over the past few years uh, for different astrologers. I think you mentioned that, right, Patrick? Uh, yeah, no, it's pretty much like uh, you know one of my go-to uh, gifts uh, now for uh, for my wife, Beth. Uh, she uh, she loves a uh, honeycomb uh, uh, planner, and uh, I love the artwork choices that you have in them. I love the Hellenistic plugin. I love that it's like customized to your time zone. It's just uh, really really cool. And if you want, you can also go if you go visit my YouTube channel as well. I I kind of do a little bit of a more in depth review, sort of showing you what it looks like. Um, you know, uh, I looked at you know I'm, yeah I'm a big fan of honeycomb, so. Uh, I, uh, it's, it's a really solid, uh, gift, uh, to get someone for the birthday or, you know, for the holidays. So, uh, yeah, I definitely recommend. Cool. I think it's, a, a truly fantastic learning tool for students of astrology. You know, they're, you know, as a, as a teacher of astrology, there's, I'm very aware of what can be taught and then what I can't teach as a teacher. And what I can't teach, but is absolutely necessary, um, is uh, I was just say uh, repeated observation over time, like seeing what the transits do, seeing what Mars moving through this part of your chart, in this part of your chart, in this part of your chart. Like, what does that mean? Like, the uh, you know, holding that awareness of what's happening to your chart and what's happening in the world as you observe the world, as you observe your own life. Um, there's no replacement for that, you know, that that sort of participatory observation over time. Um, you know, that that takes it from, you know, it takes timing techniques from an interesting idea that you're like, oh, well, that works. You, you, you know, you test it enough to see um that the theory uh works out, but then watching over time is what allows you to obtain a, a nuanced understanding. That you can then bring to future uh, predictions and forecasts for yourself and others. Yeah, because that, that's so crucial, and that's how every astrologer learns astrology is that you have to personalize the transits and you have to pay attention to what happens when a transit hits your chart and then what happens that correlates with that in your life. But in order to do that, you need to have something to know how to track your transits. So that's the purpose of something like this. Otherwise, you know, back in the day, like 20 years ago for me, I'd had to have like a print ephemeris and go through and like highlight and kind of eyeball when certain transits would happening be happening uh or i'd have to have a human ephemeris around like patrick uh, earlier in the episode in order to tell me when transits are going exact so i guess that's kind of what the honeycomb collective almanac is like is it's like having a personal human ephemeris like patrick watson standing there and telling you your transits or oh, nick dagan best um and uh, that's why i like getting the honeycomb planner with the extra pages added for note taking yeah. mm -hmm. uh so there's like more space to write down observations i've gotten a lot of really interesting observations about the moon because i feel like the moon is one of my weaker um features of astrology uh, with like using sort of predictively because it's just so common and always paying attention to it but um using the planner is able to kind of track that a little better and I started noticing like, okay, when the moon goes through my second house, like that tends to be like, that's like when money sort of comes in, it's almost unexpectedly, uh, it's sort of pretty consistent, but like when there are other factors there, it's like expenses, you know, <laughs> when the moon goes through, like yeah. Mars is going through my yeah. second, it's yeah, like I, when the moon goes through, it's like, oh, that's when that bill came in, you know? 
Uh, I oh, actually, yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, I actually use um, uh, observing the moon as the the basis of of uh, teaching transits because the moon conjoins every planet in your chart every month and conjoins every other planet in the sky every month. And so you get to see an activation from all of those every every single month. And so you can start mm -hmm. building up an understanding, you know, on a month to month level rather than having to wait another 27 years for Saturn to move into X sign. Right. Um, and I encourage yeah. my students to keep a journal and make notes, which the honeycomb planner has um, and has room for. So, again, it's a great tool from an educational point of view as well. Cool. Well, people can check that out at honeycomb.co. And uh, yeah, shout out to Honeycomb and Norwak for sponsoring this episode and making this possible. All right. So let's move into talking about detailed treatment of the astrology of, of November. I'm going to cast a chart here for November 1st, uh, which is looks like a fabulous chart. I'm going to say subjectively because that's my birthday. Um, <laughs> but let's talk about the early transits in astrology of November, we can see right at the top of the month, the three inner planets, the Sun, Venus, and Mercury are all moving through Scorpio. Um, and during the course of the first half of the month, basically those three planets pretty quickly will run into um, the opposition with Uranus, which is at 17 degrees of Taurus, and the square with Saturn at 18 degrees of Aquarius. So for the first week or two of the month, I think this is our main signature, or it's one of our main signatures. It's all of those planets in Scorpio completing and filling out a T-square with Saturn and Uranus in, in Aquarius and uh, Taurus. So, so a lot of tension there, reactivating the tension already occurring in the fixed signs that's happening with the square of those two outer planets, as well as the eclipses taking place there. I'd say that looks like, um, especially with Mercury being conjunct the Sun opposite Uranus, I would think that would probably speak to events that have the sort of thematic quality of like um, surprise disclosures or, uh, you know, October surprises, one might say, or November surprises in this case. Uh, since Mercury is the messenger planet and in opposition to Uranus, which shows sort of tension between. Mercury's trying to stay hidden, but Uranus wanting to blow things up or or uh, or uh, you know disperse a message, perhaps. So I would think it would almost be like the disclosure of private information, something like that. Um, uh, yeah, and that's of course like November eighth. Like we, I think it was Rick Levine who first pointed out over a year ago that November eighth, of course, is the day of the midterm elections, in the United States, and you have this gnarly eclipse taking place. Um, on that day where the moon um, hits its full moon and eclipse state at 16 degrees of Taurus in exact opposition to the sun and Mercury at 16 Scorpio and squaring Saturn at 18 Aquarius. So there's something about Uranus. <laughs> right. So there's something about the disruptive quality um, that we've been talking about all year of, um, I think one of the best metaphors was just the idea that we've come up with over the past year and a half was the idea of something that's stable and something that seems like a firm foundation but isn't built very solidly getting a stress test and in some instances collapsing under the weight of that stress once it receives a bit of a shakeup. Uh, and it's not that everything will collapse, but it, what is cer certain is that different people, especially that have those fixed signs prominent in those specific degrees around the middle of the fixed signs prominent in their chart are getting some sort of stress test. And then the question of whether the, the foundation is solid or whether uh, it's not solid enough to survive you know, a metaphorical earthquake or what have you. Mm -hmm. and, and that's interesting to consider like for President Biden's chart because his Mars, I believe, is in middle of Scorpio, which would be opposed by that lunar eclipse, which occurs in his sixth house. In terms of a stress test, that's kind of literally what a midterm typically is for a sitting president. Yeah, he's very he's strongly invested in both Scorpio and Taurus, and mm -hmm. so yeah, all all of this hits uh, hits hits Biden's chart um, squarely, right? Um, so it's hitting his sixth and twelfth axis, which is either the enemy's axis or it's the health axis. Um, sixth and twelfth are, are kind of both. So on the one hand, it could be 
you know, his opponents or, or the people that are that are sort of quote unquote enemies, which is like the other political party sort of getting the upper hand in some way. Or on the other hand, we've seen a I think there was once about a year ago during the first Taurus eclipse, there was a little bit of a health thing with him. Uh, I forget what it was, wasn't it? Like a it was like a procedure or something where Kamala Harris briefly became mm-hmm. like in in charge Acting, at that time, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, that did happen. There was that brief time where she was acting president. Um, I would think another possibility of uh, a lunar eclipse happening in Biden's sixth house, since the sixth house is to do with um, employ, um, uh, employees or those who are in service to you. I would wonder if um, there would be a changeover in staff, prominent staff members of uh, Biden's White House. Um, That's since those would be like sixth house figures in relation to him would be like people who report to him, such as the chief of staff, or um, I haven't looked at any of the charts of those people to see who would be implicated exactly in that. But I would think that, um, you know, it could be that depending on the outcome of the midterms, maybe there would be certain people announcing resignations or uh, certain changeovers in, in his team, basically, for the next makes- two years. Yeah, that's a really good insight. And I I think that connects to the broader theme of eclipses and rising and falling, um, you know, House of the Dragon stuff, you know, which the power is always in the House of the Dragon. Um, And so, you know, we said earlier is when it's not that every time there's an election or somebody becomes the leader um, that there's an eclipse, but when there is, um, we see more dramatic and telling rises and falls, right? right. Um, like Kanye has spouted off um, many, many times over the last several years. This one, which can like this bout, which coincided with this eclipse on the tail, seems um, seems like a definitive line cross and a change in trajectory, mm-hmm. right? And so, uh, just taking that principle and um, bringing it to an election. Well, election is literally who has power. Who retains power, who gains power, and who loses power, right? And so we should uh, I, we should be seeing much more of a sea change sort of thing, right? Um, where it's not just well, this is what the next two years look like because that's how long the terms are or whatever, mm-hmm. but like you know, the, we're we're looking at at something that has, uh, yeah, more significance, um, more significance in in terms of its themes and proportions. Yeah, I mean, the conjunction with Uranus and the disruptive quality of that eclipse conjunct Uranus happening right on uh, election day makes me nervous about what the disruption is um, in terms of the implications for that uh, about the future of the country going forward um, when it's combined together with you know that Uranus return in Gemini that's coming up later in this decade that we've talked so much about, which in the past coincided with either the Civil War or World War II. And the issues of whether there's either an internal conflict or an external conflict of some sort, um, having this as a as a disruptive eclipse um, implies that this midterm election and whatever comes from it is going to be much more important and much more um, disruptive in the overall sort of history of the country. I think than than other midterm elections. Let's say that were maybe less important. Right. You know, the moon. Um, since the moon has that connection to like the people and the collective as opposed to the leader um it's interesting to consider that if the moon on the day of the election is going to be eclipsed and conjunct uranus that would almost seem to suggest that the kind of emotional trajectory of the populace at the time would be oriented towards um i suppose change or freedom at any cost uh, when you look back at previous lunar eclipses that were conjunct Uranus and Taurus that happened close to midterm elections, uh, such as in 1938 um, or 1874, or I think there's at least like one other one, um, you can see how the the results of those elections, even if they didn't result in a change in who controlled the levers of power, the change was that the the kind of common thread seemed to be that the agenda of the president for the next two years was somehow frustrated. So, for example, in 1938, that was uh, the second term of FDR, and basically that midterm election, uh, the Democrats actually held on to power in 1938, but the kind of Democrats who were elected in 1938 ended up kind of bringing an end to 
the uh, spate of New Deal legislation, and you could almost draw an analogy between the kind of ending of the kind of New Deal emergency measures and potentially an end to some of the emergency relief measures that were introduced after COVID. So when we, I mean, some of this is already in motion. So for example, people are going to start paying on student loans again, starting in January, right around the time that the new Congress will be coming in. Um, so I would think that part of what Uranus might represent is pe- the, the people kind of abandoning basically the restrictions of uh, that have been put in place for for COVID, or the emergency relief measures have been put in place for COVID, and there might be um, this uh, this feeling of like let's get on with it, let's just sort of embrace you know Uranus, you know, uh, sat and be damned, and so um, that's yeah. um, There's not like a rebe- encouraging. rebelliousness of Uranus, oftentimes like a rebellious quality whenever Uranus gets activated, whether it's in a transit or whether it's in a mundane chart, but an attempt to push off whatever the establishment is or or is seen as at that time. Of course, another way you could envision Uranus would be um, you know, obviously because of the uh reversal of Roe v. Wade, the I it makes sense that there's going to be tremendous energy on enthusiasm of um, the voting populace to to protect abortion rights, which are essentially is like Uranus, right? It's like my my body, my choice. It's it's freedom from government restrictions. So that I would think there would also be like a, a parallel um, uh, trajectory or, or uh, momentum from voters to to protect uh, abortion rights. So um, maybe I'm not reading that correctly, but I, I would associate that with with Uranus to some degree. Yeah, I mean, Personal we didn't autonomy. have, you know, since the last forecast episode, it just started to develop when we were starting to record, I think. But um, what was happening in Iran with, at first, what became protests of women that were protesting and, and issues that were going on there in um, in terms of the way that women were being treated and the death, actually, of, of a woman that sparked everything but then it seems like it's grown into a much wider sort of countrywide protest um, since that time that seems tied in with the uh, Saturn Uranus square, even though it was initially kind of kicked off under a Mercury retrograde with that Mars and Gemini. Well, but, but Saturn and Uranus were square within a degree that whole month. And it's, right. um, you know, it's, it's uh, Uranus uh, in Taurus is in an, a Venus ruled sign, right? And so that mm-hmm. traditionally correlates with you know, uh, a young woman's right to not be beaten to death in custody, um, as well as the um, reproductive rights, um, as well as the, um, you know, less dramatic, but very important issues that Uranus and Taurus has repeatedly brought up, which is bringing us back to the basics of, you know, bread and oil, right? Energy and food. Um, And that there's, you know, if we're looking at the source of instability, right? It's, uh, well, currency, bread and oil, Right, are it's where uh, it, it, that I was going to say that that is the fuel for a lot of uh, a lot of the instability we've seen, um, and we'll be fueling plenty of you know uh, instability in other places besides the United States. Um, but you know, the Uranus and Taurus is very much willing to you know, in, in a sense, Uranus and Taurus is very much the bread riot, right? It's the it, you know, it's the it's the willingness to reject or revolt um or invalidate an existing authority based on the status of you know bread and oil right and that's that's we know that that's a huge that and uh inflation um are huge issues going into this election in the united states yeah and, well, be, and so it's, be it seems yeah but anyway just so the moon is with your with uranus and taurus so it seems like the collection of issues which uranus and taurus um has advocated for over the last several years will be the winners and that those are those issues are not necessarily do not necessarily line line up perfectly with political parties but mm-hmm. to the degree that they do i think those issues will you know will be will win as far as what is most concerning and what sways votes yeah well it'll be interesting to see if the um uranus energy is the rejection of the party that's in power versus if the disruptive element is sort of like Patrick was saying, it was the fact that with the Supreme Court thing that happened this year, 
um, if women's reproductive rights becomes uh, the unexpected curveball Uranian thing that throws or changes the result of the midterms that otherwise would have been just simply the usual US back uh, thing of going back and forth between the two parties and things changing like that. But I guess because issues like that are are really what's up for vote, like women's reproductive rights in November, definitely everybody should go vote, you know, whatever your political views are, um, if some of that stuff is important to you. Right. One other thing I would mention too about Mercury is you know, because it's going to be conjoining the sun on that day, that means it's going to be changing phase from morning star to evening star. So Mercury will be switching sects. There would be a changing of the guard in some ways of, of Mercury and the kind of quality and character it has, which, you know, could be consistent with, uh, you know, a changeover in, in, in who, who holds the reins of power in those houses, uh, of either of representatives or of senators, but, um, you know, more research probably have to be done to see, you know, the phase of Mercury coincides with previous elections. It's kind of difficult to um, differentiate between, you know, making predictions for the Senate versus the House. Um, I currently don't have a methodology to, to address that, but, um, but you we'll, know, we'll get to yeah. see in like two weeks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So going, going back, one of the things that reminds me of is the uh, Sun Venus Kazemi is one of the other things that happened recently where that was, there's was that conjunction of the sun and Venus, which occurred in the sign of Libra. And what was interesting about that is it was the first time in that series that the sun and Venus conjoined in that sign after a century of those conjunctions taking place in Scorpio. Um, so there was like a, a broader century wide shift that took place. And this is what I talked about um, in the interview with Ariel Gutman, who, who really emphasized that in my interview with her on the Venus star point, which is her the focus of her research. And she was really emphasizing how, you know, this otherwise short-term cycle of Venus conjoining the sun, which we think of as more of a, a short-term thing that happens relatively frequently, um, how this was actually a bigger shift that not just showed um a shift in terms of the way that things have been for a century, but she actually pointed out that. Um, these Venus cycles are connected to a longer 250 year cycle. So this, this conjunction series that's starting in Libra right now and over the course of the next uh, decade is going to re be repeating back basically the same conjunctions of the Sun and Venus that were taking place back around the time of when the United States was founded with the Declaration of Independence and other things like that because it's on a 250 year cycle. So in that way, it's actually very similar to the Pluto cycle, which we're also having a return of now going back to when the country was founded. So that really emphasized some themes about us being in a really crucial time right now where um, the period of the Declaration of Independence and the Revolutionary War starts repeating itself in the sky, not just through Pluto, but all through, also through Venus. And there's something it's like we already know we're living in remarkable times, but there's something about seeing repeated um, astrological things that just keep reminding us more and more of how important of times and how crucial the times are that um, really gives you a, a bigger sense of, of what's going on right now, having greater importance than it may seem. So right. in, in looking at that longer Venus cycle, are we looking at sort of the invisible guiding passions? um that move the more visible events in history the invisible guiding passions i mean one of the things we're talking about is like accords um in this instance with like the one of the things we're talking about on like the i did the libra episode this month and we talked a little bit about like social contracts and laws and things like that and even concepts like democracy in the form of government that's used um, and the sort of like social experiment that that is in like a longer term, several thousand year context, um, and that potentially being relevant here in part of what the the return is now of, of coming back and revisiting some stuff from when the country was founded, um, especially with both political parties raising questions and making accusations about whether the um, democratic process itself is still viable or whether there's something wrong with it at this point or whether um you know it might be 
you know, tossed to the side at some point if certain things, you know, happen. So I think that's one of the questions that's up for grabs right now with this shift. A renewal of the social contract. That's kind of interesting uh, to think about in terms of Venus switching signs, because I, I would think it would have some sort of social dimension, right? And, you know, yeah, politics or how we decide to organize ourselves, that is, that is, you know, primarily, a, you know, a social uh, function, a function of our social relation to each other and what we agree on the, what the proper way we should treat each other is and, and, uh, you know, how our society is, is kind of organized. And, and um, I think that's uh, a less commonly discussed uh, dimension of Venus. You know, we tend to think of Venus maybe more primarily in terms of art or aesthetics or passion, romance. But I think on a mundane level, it definitely has to do with um, our sort of social relation to each other as groups, as like nations, as peoples, religious groups, etc. And that's why, you know, when Venus goes retrograde, you sometimes see things you wouldn't expect to see from Venus, like social discord, you know, between groups of people. Uh, based on nationality or or what have you, so one well, also attempts to find balance and like what happens when things become unbalanced mm-hmm. and it attempts to fix that and, and cause and bring things back into a balance by having a counterpoint or a counterweight, but sometimes that counterweight goes too far in an opposite direction. Yeah, one of the other things I think we we mentioned when we were talking about the earlier was uh, the fact that. Venus's star point moving from Scorpio into Libra means that the majority now of the Venus star points occur in masculine signs. Aries, Gemini, Leo, Libra, and um, Capricorn is the only one that doesn't fit. So well, they all are now happening in four out of five are now happening in an air or fire sign, which is interesting in itself. Right. All conjunctions. Um, as well as just all the conjunctions in this leg of the Venus star point happening in Scorpio over the past century, and now they're going to be happening in Libra for the next century. Right. Um, and whether there's any... That's, so there's uh, there's a documentary uh, series that's very interesting called The Century of the Self mm. that was about the last century um, and about the, what do we say, uh the the <clears throat> growth of the individual individualistic viewpoint um which you know it, it, it i don't the the documentary treats with it in a really nuanced way we could you know sometimes it looks like narcissism sometimes it looks like individual freedom but it tracks that throughout most of the world through the last century that's very interest that's very interesting to think that we had uh venus uh, Venus Sun conjunctions in Scorpio um, during that. That that sounds like century of the self. Um, you know, Scorpio is much more self oriented, which isn't always selfish, but it's you know taking care of oneself. Um, maintaining. You know, Mars is very uh, Mars world signs are very interested in maintaining one's um, sort of say independence and um, you know uh, individual capability. Um, as opposed to Libra, which is much more interested in relationality, right? Much more interested in, in a web of uh, of relations and balancing um, all of those scales. And I, I, you know, I don't know. I think just observing the present in the last couple of years, there does seem to be. It does seem like the obsession with individuality has hit a point where we don't need to focus on that anymore. Um, what good, um, <laughs> uh, what points there were uh, in focusing on oneself uh, have been made. I think we're all aware of the value of that, whereas I think people are less and less uh, are less uh, are, are aware that the societies in which they live are l- less interested in relations than they could be, um, that maybe we've had enough focus on the self for a century or so. Anyway, that's that's interesting, just musing. Yeah. So um, big shifts. So, and, and that's talking about Libra and focus on the Libra component. Um, it might be worth asking what some of your keywords are for Scorpio, though, since we have such a, a emphasis 
on those placements with the three outer planets there over the course of the first half of the month. Um, and just that how that's filling out the leg of the T-square. So it's bringing in a component that's going to add tension um, to this month by not just having the Saturn Uranus square, but just having the Scorpio planet swoop in there and hit all of that, starting with Venus, which is going to oppose Uranus and then square Saturn on, Mar on November 5th and 6th. Um, so normally you have Venus opposite Uranus, which has sort of a disruptive influence on the Venusian attempt to uh, create relationships and bonds between other people and venus sometimes either disrupts that or it um makes it different it makes it so that people relate to each other in a very different um sometimes what seems as like odd or unusual way uh, but then immediately after that venus squares saturn which is usually like a cooling effect on relationships where uh, relationships sometimes become more cold or distant and it's it's interesting seeing Venus have those two aspects back to back right at the same time. What are some of your takes, Austin, or keywords for Scorpio? Well, so you know, one of the things that's associated with Scorpio that uh, I would agree with is that there is a well, there is a theme of secrecy or keeping things hidden, or in the case of the Scorpion itself, like keeping things armored. Right, keeping 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 the things that are important or tender behind um, you know behind either a physical barrier or a visual barrier or an auditory barrier, and that emphasis on sort of beneath under uh, under the radar underground um, concealed to some degree is um, <clears throat> further emphasized by the eclipse which just happened. Eclipses, of course, are um moments of obscuration um and the fact that both mercury and venus will not be visible to the naked eye for most of the month mm -hmm. right they're, they're too they're close they're so close to the sun nobody will see them in the east nor in the west right yeah. so there's like an internalizing of it in a sign that already tends to internalize things yeah yeah and so we have this like you know with venus maybe there's sort of like a simmering on things like you know the emotional activity is not on the surface it's in a mars world sign it's sort of like simmering or you know maybe with mercury um mercury similarly invisible we have some sort of brooding there's definitely um yeah there's definitely that that kind of half you know the the activity being concealed which doesn't mean that the activity is not important um you know through brooding we may come upon um, an idea that moves us or some, or a plan, uh, or, um, with Venus, like mm, we may brood and simmer about a relationship before deciding uh, upon a course of action. Um, and so those, those invisible things, invisible Mercury and Venus and that brooding and simmering are all are really important because Mercury rules Mars, Mars is Mars is dramatic retrograde actions are coming out of whatever Mercury is brooding on. Um, and then um, the lunar eclipse and Uranus are in a Venus ruled sign. So that's coming out of whatever the, the, the like the, you know, the emotional stew is the relational emotional stew with Venus is. So it's interesting because we're going to see the effects um, of Mercury and Venus very clearly, but we won't, it will be hard to see, see the source, right? You won't see the um you know the the thoughts and feelings writ plain upon the face you'll just see the results of the actions something that this alignment summit kind of reminds me of is um back in 2018 in october there was the venus retrograde in scorpio opposite uranus and taurus and that happened actually shortly before the 2018 midterms and one of the big stories from that midterm election was the um the fact that this was happening in the aftermath of the me too uh disclosures and so you had uh you had a lot of uh uh female voters women voters uh going to the polls on mass to um both vote in a record number of uh women candidates for office but also as a way of like getting the men out uh, and uh it sort of it, it was kind of an expression of this of uh the you know, anger and, and frustration about the uh, the injustices that, that were being disclosed through you know the the Me Too movement that 
emerged in a similar time frame uh, in the previous month as Jupiter ingressed into, um, well, no, that was, I think, the p- past year. So this has like been building up for a whole year. Because remember, that was the 2018 was the whole like um, the uh, Brett Kavanaugh uh, yeah, nomination and everything and that happened with uh, with that as well. So this is, it was kind of a, I sort of see that, you know, we can kind of draw a comparison then between like an amped up like uh, electorate of, of of women advocate, you know, wanting to vote for women's issues uh, with that Venus retrograde opposition to Uranus and Taurus and Scorpio from October 2018 and this iteration where the sun is conjunct Venus opposite Uranus and we can sort of see how that is probably another way that this ties into um, the, you know, an, an overwhelming hopefully, <laughs> uh, a movement of uh, people voting for um, for women's rights and uh, for reproductive freedom. Um, so That's a good point, though, that, that Venus, Venus transiting through Scorpio, um, sometimes it can be associated with um, the fascination with or sometimes the attempts to find beauty or seeing beauty in things which other people consider off-putting or morbid. And so you get sometimes like the um, like goth aesthetic as an aesthetic, like or or just a dark aesthetic as yeah. a sort of a trend or a fashion trend in some sense. But also sometimes Venus and Scorpio, <laughs> Venus and Scorpio likes to go to yeah. the darker darker places and sometimes dredge up things from the past um, that are difficult to talk about or deal with. Um, and sometimes that can, that can be a theme as well. <laughs> Come to think of it, I uh, on the day Venus ingressed into Scorpio, um, me and my wife decided to show our kids Phantom of the Opera for the first time, which my, uh, my daughter was like so weirded out by because it was it was like you know this story about this guy who's like crazy obsessive and you know broods down as the angel of music in the you know basement of this opera house or whatever and. It was, uh, we didn't really plan it like that, but it ended up being this very, like, kind of Venus and Scorpio, uh, type of, uh, event. And I certainly think of, um, I think you could certainly associate that archetype of Venus and Scorpio with, like, a story and character, like, uh, the Phantom of the Opera. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very, look, he spends most of his time brooding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And even when he's seen, it's, all. it's, you know, half obscured with the mask. Right. Yeah. There you go. Mm. Yeah, so so a lot of those aspects with the Scorpio stuff, the more difficult, intense, both the disruptive as well as the depressive aspects of that, with those three inner planets first opposing Uranus and then hitting Saturn, take place between November fourth uh, and then eventually culminate by November eighth and ninth, once the Sun and Mercury can join uh, at those same degrees, and then eventually will pass Saturn and be finished with it by, it looks like, November 11th. Um, So on the bright side, in terms of positive aspects happening this month, one of the things that once you get past that stuff in the first and second week um, that starts to balance things out a little bit is that Jupiter now has retrograded back into late Pisces. So all of the Scorpio planets, once they get to late Scorpio, will start trining Jupiter before they head out of that sign. And I feel like that brings a bit of um, even if temporary, a bit of relief and a bit of um, balance to some of these things uh, once things start to calm down after the more disruptive um, sort of influences of earlier in the month. So it looks like we have Venus trining Jupiter here, November 13th and 14th. Um, then we get Mercury trining Jupiter, November 15th. And then eventually the Sun catches up and trines Jupiter around November 20th. Um, so that's one of the more positive aspects I would highlight this month. And that actually um, brings up, now that I think about it, our, our auspicious election for this month, which Lisa Scheim and I picked out uh, for the Auspicious Elections podcast, which takes place on November 13th in order to take advantage of this grand trine. And we set it for basically cast a chart for November 13th and set it for just after uh, 12 o'clock noon, so November 13th, 12 o'clock noon, you'll end up with a chart that has Aquarius rising, like early Aquarius rising, probably in your location, 
And the focus of this chart is it's actually a Saturn election because we have a day chart with Aquarius rising and Saturn in Aquarius. Now that Saturn is actually direct and coming out of its retrograde phase, it creates a, a nice little period where you can start doing some Saturn elections again if you want to try to take advantage of the last several months of Saturn in Aquarius before it departs for Pisces uh, in March. So the electional chart has Aquarius rising with Saturn in Aquarius in the first house in the day chart. Um, it has the moon in Cancer in the sixth whole sign house, but it's applying to trines with the sun and Mercury and Venus, which are all in Scorpio in the 10th house, hovering around the midheaven. And the moon is also applying to a trine with Jupiter, which is at 28 degrees of Pisces in the second whole sign house. And that's actually one of the reasons we liked this chart is it's one of those rare charts where both the first house of the self and the one initiating the election are actually in good shape, as well as the second house of finances, so that it's a relatively decent chart for financial matters because it has Jupiter in a day chart in its domicile in the second whole sign house. Um, yeah, and then Venus up there at 26 degrees of Scorpio, applying pretty closely within two degrees to a trine uh, with the planet Jupiter. So what we're trying to do is take advantage of this grand water trine that happens right here on November 13th and to use that for electional purposes in order to start a new major venture or undertaking. Uh, yeah, so that's our electional chart for the month. What do you what do you guys think? Yeah, it looks like a good uh, good moment for the the prudent allocation of resources for long-term benefit. Hmm. I like that. I like that way of way of phrasing things. Um, yeah, I think it would make good sense for like a business or something. Uh, I think there are some decent, uh, yeah, financial um, benefits to that time. Yeah. So this is one of our electional charts. Lisa and I are about to record our auspicious elections podcast for patrons, where we look at. We're going to get four other charts for different elections and lucky dates for November uh, that we're going to release here in the next few days, and then. Uh, we also last month released finally our separate uh, year ahead 2023 electional astrology report where we went through the next 12 months and we picked out the single most auspicious or lucky date that we could find in all of the next 12 months of 2023. So that's really awesome and it's something people have enjoyed. We've been doing it for a few years now and it keeps getting more and more popular just because people like to be able to plan ahead for things like starting a business or weddings or major trips or major um, business deals or other things like that. And that's kind of the purpose of this report is to give you the, the best dates next year to do that. So you can find out more information at theastrologypodcast.com slash 2023 report. Yeah. You need to be able to plan more than a month ahead for a lot of things. Yeah. And it's like we give people the, that's why we first did that report a few years ago, because usually we do the monthly report that's just for patrons. It just gives you the most lucky dates for the next four weeks, but oftentimes people want to plan ahead. So we did, went ahead and made this year ahead report as a separate product for those that you know want to know when to launch something next summer, or next spring, or something like that. Yeah. Cool. All right. So back to the transits for this month. So that's the nice little warm sort of fuzzy center of the of November as far as I'm concerned is that grand water trine that occurs right there around the middle of the month because what happens after that is we get um, a pretty stark tone shift as soon as planets start departing from Scorpio and moving into Sagittarius around November 15th and no November 16th starting with Venus moving into Sagittarius at that time then we get Mercury moving into Sagittarius right after it and then a few days later, we get the sun moving into Sagittarius by November 21st and 22nd. Um, and then right after that, we get the moon who catches up to all of those planets and then conjoins the sun. And we get our first non-eclipse lunation in a while, which is a new moon at one degrees of Sagittarius. So this is not just a tone shift in terms of all of the inner planets moving in relatively quick succession from the sign of Scorpio to the sign of Sagittarius, but also um, it moves the activations from activating that Saturn-Uranus square between Aquarius and Taurus 
And all of those Sagittarius uh, planets, as soon as they move into Sag, they start moving into an opposition with that retrograde Mars and Gemini, um, which by this point is in the mid to early 20 degrees of Gemini. So it starts building up to, it moves from one type of tension in activating the Saturn Uranus square to starting to build up a different type of tension later in November, which is activating that Mars retrograde in Gemini. Yeah, it's uh, th there is a really stark difference between the first and second halves of the month in terms of tone. Um, it's worth noting that even even though the planets in, uh, the planets in Scorpio are intersecting with the Saturn Uranus and there's the eclipse, it's still a Mars ruled sign, but it's the quiet, you know, let's let's go with broody uh, Mars ruled sign. And mm -hmm. then when they leave there into you know much louder Sagittarius, much more expressive, louder, big, loud, bright Sagittarius, then they're moving into opposition with Mars. And so they're, you know, Mercury, Venus, Sun are doing Mars all month, but they're kind of doing the quiet underground side for the first half. And then they get increasingly loud as we get into the second half. Yeah, loud and, and rambunctious and argumentative, which is both a a Mars thing, but it's also an opposition thing that the um, oppositions can be contrarian or can oppose things, sometimes presenting a, a counterpoint, but other times just, you know, opposing things for the sake of riling things up or disrupting things. Right in time or, for or, Thanksgiving. Yeah, or just reacting to things, right? Reacting things, reacting to things in a loud way rather than uh, a quiet way. And, uh, and then obviously, a lot of what was, um, you know, planned, uh, planned, uh, planned in shadow during the first half of the month will become clear uh, during the second half of the month as the Mercury and Venus and the Sun move into more visible, um, the more visible sign of Sagittarius, and Mercury and Venus start to appear again in the night sky. Right, you know the the combination of Mercury and Venus together. You know, if Mercury's like poetry, you know, uh, when it's encountering venus this planet of uh, artistry and venus you might broadly correspond with music uh we might think that uh you know mercury and venus appearing out of the beams in the sign of sagittarius would probably be like the emergence of uh um you know some notable like work of pop and actually it's really interesting because 40 years earlier there was a very similar mercury venus conjunction in that sign and that just happened to be um, in 1982, at the end of November, when Thriller was released, which was like one of the most successful albums of all time. So I'm not saying like we're going to get another Thriller necessarily. Um, when I looked back at a previous time that Mercury and Venus were in Sagittarius opposite Mars retrograde in Gemini, that happened to be in November of 1990 when um, Madonna put out a music video that was uh, that had such sort of graphic content in the music video that it was actually banned by MTV at that time. And so I'm curious if the opposition from Mars to that Mercury and Venus could uh, show like musicians or entertainers being sort of uh, censored or, or you know, blocked from social media or something like that. Um, you know, maybe not on a Kanye level, <laughs> but uh, maybe on a, in a sort of a different way that there would be sort of certain transgressive uh, works of art or, or, or statements by uh artists or musicians that would sort of come under fire you know as mercury and venus move into that opposition with mars in a similar yeah. way that they did in november 1990. yeah scandalous similar. works of culture mm. it's funny that you mentioned that because she actually posted about that again recently and she was like trying to take credit for being like a trailblazer that paved the way for other oh. entertainers and performers <laughs> and it got it got a lot She's of pushback well, and this is kind of funny too, because we have a um, we have a DD rated time for Madonna. She might, she may be a Virgo rising, which would be interesting because that would mean that the Mars retrograde in Gemini at 1990 would have occurred in her tenth house of current reputation when she had her music video uh, blocked. So if she um, if she'll have that same transit again, Mercury with Mars going retrograde in her tenth house, then you know we might say there could be a similar sort of situation especially because mars will be opposing her saturn either way so it's um it could be a treacherous transit maybe specifically for madonna again or it might just apply in a more general way to like 
works of art or artists in general, you know, as Mercury and Venus are conjunct opposite Mars retrograde in Gemini. Yeah. So I do like two of the things you said. Um, I like the, hold on, am I sharing the chart? Let me share the chart here. Uh, the, the Venus Mercury, the Mercury Venus conjunction around November 20th um, looks very nice as a, as a nice little aspect that happens this month and a relatively positive one before it gets fully into that degree based opposition with Mars. Um, and then you mentioned Thanksgiving. And while some of those other oppositions are not super close that day, um, I think applying. at least, well, they're applying, but the moon does swoop in actually. And it looks like the moon will oppose Mars either either that day or the following day, which does seem kind of kind of tense in terms of US Thanksgiving and, and Mars's tendency for argumentativeness and, and things like that. Yeah, or uh, or maybe uh, you know um, deep fried turkey mishaps, right? Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, there tend there tends to be a common thing, you know, each year. But I'd think, especially this year, like issues to do with heat, you know, it, it just Mars is Mars is wilding, you know, uh, at that point, and so it just seems like um, uh, you know maybe maybe you shouldn't use the gas stove in this time. Maybe go with like a safer option for heating, or uh, you know maybe just go with. A ham, you know, that cooks slow or something <laughs> instead of the the deep fried turkey. Um, so you yeah, this shilling, is shilling for the pork industry now. Why not? Ham? <laughs> well, <dare> uh, <laughs> um, announcing the third sponsor. No, oh, yeah. um, yeah. ham. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah that's, so, so going back to the opposition. So we're getting late into the month at this point when those oppositions with Mars actually start completing, especially. Mercury opposing Mars from 19 degrees of Sagittarius to 19 degrees of Gemini on November 29th is one of the most argumentative and, and difficult aspects of late in the month because um, Mercury usually is communication and Mars is classically the planet of war and discord and fighting. So you end up with, um, at the very least, like arguments and uh, contention and, and uh, difficult statements being made. Then Shortly after that, November 30th, we get Venus opposing Mars uh, in the classic tension between those two. Uh, and then it's not until the following month that we get the Sun Mars opposition eventually. Uh, but that'll have to save, we'll have to save that for December. Well, it's important to note, though, as we're ending November, we're, um, we're on our, we're one week out from the exact Sun Mars opposition, which is also a full moon conjunct that <laughs> Mars. So yeah. that's and that's what it's going to feel like it's leading to because that's mm -hmm. what it's leading to. Things are things are really heating up in a very visible, very active way by the end of the month. You know, that like brooding, tectonic, half invisible dragon path like, you know, that like those sort of half concealed but powerful changes which characterize the first half of the month give way to really obvious, really uh, annoyingly loud um, action-packed changes by the end of the month. That yeah. uh, full moon is right on Kanye's sun for what it's, whatever it's worth. And another person who's really getting, getting hit hard by this is, is probably going to be Trump because with Mars going retrograde, you know, really close to his son, he's been served with that $250 million lawsuit fraud, for fraudulent uh, operation of his nonprofit. And then he, uh, He's also been officially subpoenaed for the January 6th uh, committee, and he is going to have to testify to some of these things in November and probably going into December. And that particular full moon on Mars retrograde in Gemini is really interesting because it's sort of an inversion of when he first announced for president under a Sun-Moon-Mars conjunction in Gemini around the same degree. So it's been about seven and a half years since... Uh, his announcement date in June 2015. So it's kind of interesting that we're having this sort of similar geometry of the Sun, Moon, and Mars in Gemini, um, and that that's happening, you know, in a similar place uh, in uh, in his chart as he will be dealing with um, this uh, lawsuit and you know with uh, continuing sort of um, you know problems from the uh, January 6th committee investigations. So. Uh, yeah, so, and also just uh, for the rest of us, right? 
Um, this is also just like, if you've got, I'm just sorry, I'm thinking about my chart and everybody who has mutable planets, right? right? Like part of that shift, not only like quiet, but um, maybe very important shifts to, you know, loud, like there's the quiet loud part, but there's also fixed to mutable, right? For the fixed signs, um, you know, y'all get it during the first half. Um, my, yeah. my mutable brethren and I will be in the crosshairs, uh, for the second half, uh, yeah. uh, of, of we, November, quite obviously. The, the and also, de you know, delegation representing the delegation from the fixed signs will be handing the baton over to you guys in the second half of November for, where the mutable signs will, will take things over in terms of getting some of the rough transits. Yeah. And, you know, that's already true, especially for, um, planets in Gemini, right? My poor Gemini moon. Um, you know, the gem, the, the Gemini sun people, you know, especially those of you who've, who are holding your shit together a lot better than Kanye, despite the, uh, the, the out of control Mars influence. And then, you know, all the planets in Sag just, you know, amplify all of that. It's worth noting that that Jupiter at the very end of Pisces is, is a ray of sunshine or at least, um, like a right. soothing balm for the mutables, you know, it, it for the like, burn. yeah. Yeah, like yes, there are Neptune problems. Like yes, Mars is doing this, but like it's a it is the greater benefic in one of the signs that it rules. Like it's there's definitely some help there. It's definitely at least a you know at least a yeah like a nice a nice balm a nice medicated balm. Yeah. So in terms Same of that grace. though, for the for the mutable signs having the Mars retrograde fully heat up during this time and grind over a bunch of those planets. Mars is a planet where sometimes there can be more aggressiveness, acts of aggression, um, acts of discord, um, acts of severing or separation, pulling things apart as opposed to Venus, which like brings things together. There's more of a, a sense of like dissension, um, but having the Mars retrograde really heat up and then having a bunch of planets oppose Mars over a few week period between late November and early December will only increase that feeling of like tension and opposition and pulling things apart, especially for those with heavy mutable sign placements, it seems like. Yeah, absolutely. And that's worth noting that with just Gemini in general, Gemini versus Sag um, versus Pisces, um, Gemini, uh, Gemini is always trying to pull things apart. Um, sometimes it's more just to see how they work, right? It's literally twins, right? It's splitting into two. Whereas Pisces and Sagittarius are both trying to get to, to make two things into one, right? Horse archer, horse archer, right? Or chaining the fish at the mouth, right? So that they're, uh, so that the, you know, uh, awareness doesn't fragment. And so there's a trying to hold it together or trying to, mm, you know, make a, a me, I should say, yeah, trying, trying to hold it together with Sagittarius, right? Trying to hold the uh, the horse and the, the person into holding them together into the centaur so that they're co uh, coordinated. Whereas Gemini is fragmenting, and then Mars is especially divisive, and so that's some of the like that's going to be some of the action is trying to hold it together um, in the midst of um, you know very fragmenting and divisive uh, energies. I think of you know with um, with Mars and in an air sign, I always think of wind's ability to scatter things right like mm. holding on to your pile of leaves like no don't take it wind i like that so yeah so that's something really building up to a culmination towards the end of november but that we're going to see the final peak of not until early december so we're kind of leaving things on a bit of a cliffhanger here um, and we'll have to check in more next month during the next month's forecast in order to see where we're at by you know, this time four weeks from now. Um, but yeah, seeing that shift from heavy emphasis on tensions in the fixed sign placements, especially for those with fixed sign rising in the first half of November to the mutable signs having the tension in the second half of November, I think is the big overall story and picture that we sort of established at this point in this forecast. Yeah. And it's it's a pretty bumpy ride the whole time. It's different kinds of bumpy. Um, I would say the first half is more disorienting, you know, a little bit like a roller coaster. You don't know you're on, um, it's a lot of times what eclipse season feels like. And if you look at, you know, what the nodes are tracking, they're tracking the like big up and down of the moon relative to the sun. It literally looks like a roller coaster. 
Um, <clears throat> but you know, the, the G forces, uh, of ascent and descent, um, don't make sense because you can't see the rising and falling. You're just like, I don't know. It feels really different. Like as if you were subject to those forces, but didn't know you were on a roller coaster. Whereas everything will be very obvious uh, <laughs> during during the Sag portion of our program. You yeah. will know why you are uncomfortable. And, and just to reiterate, one of my major keywords for eclipses is just major endings and major beginnings or, or great endings and great beginnings is one of the main keywords that I always see. There is oftentimes as we're seeing like a disruptive um, influence from eclipses, but also just this notion of coming to either a great ending in some part of your life, often where in the house that matches the where the eclipse falls in your birth chart, um, but also sometimes great beginnings and like setting out on a great new chapter of your life that matches the topic of that house at the same time. Um, and sometimes there can be a bittersweet quality to that uh, in terms of the endings can be rough, but it can also set up the foundations for a whole new era of a person's life. And I think sometimes that's a good thing to keep in mind when you're going through really tumultuous or difficult or, or going through hardships um, is that sometimes, even though it sounds cliche, that even though if you have a great disruption or a great ending of something, sometimes it puts something else in place and it was the necessary thing in order to send you down a certain path from that point forward that you may not have traveled um, unless you had that sort of diversion at that point to push you in that direction. Yeah, so that is one of my final things I just want to reiterate for eclipse season, especially for everybody going through pretty heavy stuff right now during that time as we go through the second leg of that. And any other final thoughts in terms of the um, astrology of November, either in terms of the first half? I mean, we'll we'll come back next month, of course, for the second half, but any other final thoughts? I guess for me at least, it, it does seem like the it's the first half that's kind of the the most uh, alarming or concerning and the 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 second half maybe seems to be the slightly easier uh portion of it but um you know obviously this is going to be hitting everyone in their own way you know depending on the natal chart and um just uh you know the main thing i'm sort of hearing and seeing from people is that they're just um really just trying to make it through to some sort of you know resting point there's uh there's just such a widespread despair i guess you could say or or, or, or you know worry about the future and so i just um um you know sympathize and empathize in in more ways and uh you know, try to just uh, stick with it. <laughs> Hold on, please. It's it's just history. Yeah, history and cycles. It's honestly, it's getting kind of 1920s in here, which is making me a little nervous in terms of the broader like mundane events. Um, I didn't have like return of you know major media personality spreading anti-Semitism on my like 2022 bingo card, but here we are, as well as you know, record inflation, um, major tensions and the revival of old tensions with major world powers between like the US and Russia and other things like that. Um, it's interesting how much we're, we're moving into and we're starting to see how this decade is going to shape up and how much 10 years ago when we were talking about things like the Uranus return of the United States and how that was coming up and, and there was a nervousness surrounding it because of knowing how that cycle worked out in the past. It's interesting seeing all the pieces starting to move into place now so that we can start to see where this is kind of headed at this point. Do you guys have that sense of it being remarkable, like seeing all those pieces falling into place? Yes, but no less horrifying. And uh, uh, I mean, I, as I've made the point before, the United States came out of those Uranus and Gemini periods better, way better than it went in. Um, I'm half joking and half not joking when I say it's just history. Um, it definitely gets wilder and wilder for a while. Yeah. Right. I mean, um, and, uh, you know, talk to your grandparents, talk to, you know, like talk to your parents about your grandparents. People have lived through way worse than this. Um, you can do this. It's actually not nearly as hard as you fear. I mean, 
some people didn't live through that though. I mean, some, uh, I know, for but example, we have, but, but we have to figure out how to live through it. Yeah. yeah. But also how to sometimes combat or deal with the difficult things that arise, like what happened with like the Holocaust or anti-Semitism or things like that, where lots of people didn't make it through like World War II, even if countries did, or even if life went on or things like that. So that's the part that makes me nervous is just, I hope we don't see the rise of certain groups getting scapegoated or other things like that. And that's, that's a concerning trend for me that seems similar to like the 1920s. Well, yeah, I, I don't have a, uh, you know, a guidebook on on how to survive this. I don't necessarily have any, I don't know, funny little catchphrase. I'm afraid to to deal with this. I think the the virtue that needs to be cultivated is courage, um, because I think that's going to be one of the only ways we can face the worst ends of the manifestations of uh, the repetition of these uh, these cycles. Um, you know, in whatever way, whatever that sort of means to you, um, it, it, there are many ways to be courageous. Uh, but you know, it's one of the good things Mars can give you is courage. You know, maybe with Mars brightening up in Gemini, this is a uh, um, maybe this is a good time to ruminate, ponder, to think of, you know, how you can develop courage and resilience in yourself. Mm. Right. Or when is it necessary to make a stand or take a, take a fight, even though fighting is something that's naturally not something that most people enjoy or that cause, right. causes discord or other problems like that is an interesting right. question. Well, and that's, uh, that's very Mars retrograde timely. You know, right. um, we didn't talk about it this time, but part of my, I don't know, usual spiel on Mars retrograde um, is just like with Mercury retrogrades where it's time to like look like look over the communications to to um to you know to to look at how you miscommunicate or what didn't get sent whatever same with venus where there's a little bit of a like life review on an on a relational level like mars retrograde is um often best used to analyze like um what you fought for what you didn't fight for when uh how did you fight did you was that an effective way to fight maybe it was worth fighting for maybe you fought poorly in a way that even damaged your cause, right? When, you know, all these questions, when and how to fight and what's worth fighting for, and then how do you do that? Like there's a, a tactics, there's both a tactics and strategy review, as well as a question of which which things are worth fighting for. Like that's a very natural, and I would say um, maybe one of the healthiest um, uses of a Mars retrograde. Um, you often see uh, people that begin conflicts during Mars retrograde um, do so halfway through what they should have thought through, um, and they end up losing those uh, those fights that they start disastrously. You um, see a but, lot of Goliaths falling to David during Mars retrogrades. Yeah, right, because like. they're, as one of my favorite uh, martial arts instructors from my youth told me, um, speed is bullshit, timing is everything. Right. Picking, picking, picking your pick, not only picking your fights, but picking your moments. Um, so, you know, I think that's very important because we only have, we all have X amount of fight in us. Right. And uh, the amount, your, your willingness to struggle and your ability to commit meaningfully to any struggle, whether it's, you know, personal or more collective, um, that's, that's finite. And so what are you what are you committing your fight to and the natural again the healthy natural mars retrograde thing is to rethink is to do a little life review for mars right because you can always um struggle more effectively right and it's actually because um because mars's stakes are higher than they are for venus uh, or for mercury it's actually more important to be ruthlessly critical with mars that's such a great um image or phrase the, that it's coming up now in what you're saying, which is for Mars retrograde, which is sometimes the revival of old conflicts um, might be a theme for some people or for in some sectors in terms of this Mars retrograde. Oh, right. well, there is the deuterang. What was that um, again? Oh, this was something I noticed many years ago uh, during Mars retrogrades. Um, a number of people uh, reported to me who 
oh, have a uh, romantic interest in men that like old dudes were coming back around during the Mars retrogrades. And I, it just got, I heard so many reports of it that it got dubbed the, uh, the deuterang, <laughs> okay. um, uh, or, you know, and that one might want to duck captain boomerang when he comes back around again. Okay. So if, if the Venus retrograde sometimes is a return of old relationships, that might be the Mars retrograde could be the return of, of some relationships as you're saying, as you're saying as well. Yeah, because sometimes we, you know, depends on your chart. You may relate to Mars. Mars may show up primarily, like you know, two out of every twelve charts has Mars ruling the seventh house, right? Mm -hmm. But the yeah, and that the 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 like you were saying, the return of martial figures um, may end up looking like Captain Boomerang. Okay, I love the least that. That's a great. <laughs> anyway, yeah, that was that. Uh, anyway, yeah. So what duck the duck the Deuterang. All right. Hashtag Deuterang is going to be the note that we're going to end this force forecast on then uh, as we head into and get into the thick of the Mars retrograde here in November of 2022. And we'll have to save the rest for a cliffhanger for our forecast for December, which we'll be back to do again next month at the end of November. Um, all right, guys, this was an amazing, we've covered so much stuff in this episode and so many different topics. I can't believe how much we packed into this forecast. Uh, but this was really fun. I, I had a really good time. Austin, what do you have coming up? Or what are you working on over the course of the next month? Okay, so a couple things. First, the um, one of the the one of the beautiful Jupiter in Pisces elections that I did for Sphere and Sundry earlier this year uh, is slated to come out. I think December first. Um, taking advantage of that that little bit of uh, that little bit of pleasantness in the sky that Jupiter in Pisces. Um, I, I believe that's uh, codenamed uh, Butter Ocean at this point. Um, <laughs> and then uh, the, there was uh, the Mercury and Virgo uh, series that I elected just came out, and that's excellent for problem solving and doing practical shit in the midst of all this dramatic nonsense. Um, I'm also going to open up um, my self-paced year one program again during the second half of the month. I haven't decided on the day yet, um, but if you would like to be notified, um, please sign up for my mailing list. Um, just go and sign up for the mailing list. I will send an email out as soon as I know what the date is. And the last couple of times I've opened that up, it sold out extremely quickly and people yelled at me. So I'm trying to give give warning. Uh, you will if you just sign up for the mailing list, you'll get the thing. I'll put it out on Twitter and Facebook when I know what the date is, and I'll probably do a little reminder because I don't want to be yelled at anymore. Nice. So uh, websites for that are spherensundry.com, and then your personal website is austincopic.com. Yep. And go to the mailing list. Don't look for it on the website. It's not on the website yet. Yeah, that's a really good idea because also then you'll get notified when I see people in the live chat asking about 36 faces, and I know they will all get an email once that comes out at some point on that mailing I, list. I Me promise included. when I I promise when I have good news, I will shout it from the rooftops. Thank okay. you. That is the other book that's suffering inflation this year is your book on the black market selling for like <laughs> hundreds of dollars. Yeah, I've tried to get it a few times and uh I've uh it's it's always like failed like even when i wanted to spend a couple hundred on it it somehow they'd said like oh it's actually out of stock so yeah i'm i'm definitely eagerly awaiting your uh your your mailing list my book that i already wrote <laughs> yeah <laughs> my book that yeah. i literally wrote 10 years ago <laughs> i know i wish i yeah, got yeah. it then but i was I'll, too you, poor you will have a copy someday patrick yeah, speaking of patrick what do you have coming up or what are you working on this month um well uh the biggest thing that's happened is that we've released the rectification course. So if you're interested in learning how to rectify with uh, Chris and I, definitely uh, take a look at the uh, the website for uh, this course at theastrologyschool.com. And um, I, in other sort of, I guess, other sort of personal news, I have officially submitted the application for Hillary Clinton's birth time. So in about 12 weeks, we should hopefully get some closure on what her birth time actually is. If you've listened to the podcast for a long time, you'll know that that has been a, quite a saga uh, for uh, me and Chris. So uh, that will be really interesting to see what uh, the results of that inquiry will be. Um, I'm working on a presentation about uh, my take on Saturn in Pisces, and uh, my books are always open 
for general natal consultations, for electional consultations, for horaries, for rectifications. You can all find that all on my website at patrickwatsonastrology.com. And you can also find me on Twitter at pwatsonastro. And I'll put links to both of your websites in the description below this video on YouTube or on the podcast website for this episode. Um, as for myself, I'm going to have a birthday in November 1st. Interestingly, 12 years repetition of when I started podcasting, when I started a third house perfection year in 2010 and took over a podcast from a previous person that was like a precursor to this. So I'm excited about that. I've had a ton of stuff that I launched that finally came to fruition this month, not just the rectification course of Patrick, but I also published a book which is uh, I've been working on for a couple of years now, which is a translation of the work of the second century astrologer Vadius Valens and his book, The Anthology, which is one of our primary sources for Hellenistic astrology. Um, I worked with the translator, Mark Riley, who released a PDF of Valens for free about a decade ago online. Um, but one of the things about the PDF is it was missing diagrams for the 100 plus 120 chart examples that Valens uses throughout his text. So I went through and edited Mark's translation and improved it and corrected some typos, but also added some illustrations for every time Valens mentions a chart example, uh, we went through and created a diagram for it so that you can actually read it in the text and understand exactly what Valens is talking about, which is just super crucial for students of ancient astrology because it's really hard to read the anthology and then just imagine the chart in your head, but now you have illustrations that show you exactly what Valens is trying to say. Um, and you know that really helps to clarify a lot of issues in the community. One of them is it shows that Valens uses over 100 chart examples using whole sign houses, which is really sort of blatant and hard to miss if you actually read the text and you look at the example charts that he uses. So that book is out there and it's pretty exciting to have Valens out and widely readable now in published form or in print form as an actual book especially for, for those of us that prefer printed books. Um, other than that rectification course, Lisa and I announced our electional astrology report, and I also just released posters for the planetary alignments posters for 2023. This is an old promo image for the 2022 posters, but you can find the new posters that show um, the images that we use on each of these forecast episodes we created a print poster that you can put up in your wall that show all of the next 12 months of planetary alignments and movements at a glance. And you can find that at theastrologypodcast.com slash store and order, order those posters for your wall today. So um, that's what I've got going on. I'll put links to that in the description below this video uh, or on the podcast website. Um, this is an awesome episode. Thank you both for doing this, this Halloween themed episode with me um, and, and, you know, allowing us to have both moments of seriousness as well as some moments of levity as Patrick puts on his ephemeris, human ephemeris costume again. Um, next year, we may have to do some sort of costume like contest? challenge contest. Yeah. yeah for, for um, you know, listeners at the podcast. So start thinking now, like what your astrology themed costume would be. And we might have to have some sort of competition next year. So you've got 12 months to figure it out. And we'll see if anybody can beat Patrick's human ephemeris costume. <laughs> low bar, low bar. Bar is pretty high. All right. <laughs> Thanks, my friends, for joining me today. Thanks to everyone in the live chat. Thanks to the audience and everyone for watching this episode of the podcast. And we'll see you again next time. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you. A special thanks to all the patrons that helped to support the production of this episode of the podcast through our page on patreon.com. In particular, shout out to the patrons on our producers tier, including Thomas Miller, Catherine Conroy, Christy Moe, Ariana Amour, Mandy Ray, Angelique Nambo, Issa Sabah, Jake Otero, Mimi Stargazer, and Jean-Marie Kaplan. If you like the work that I'm doing here on the podcast and you would like to find a way to support it, then please consider becoming a patron through my page on patreon.com. And in exchange, you'll get access to bonus content such as early access to new episodes, the ability to attend the live recording of the month ahead forecast each month, access to a private monthly auspicious elections report that we put out each month, access to exclusive episodes that are only available for patrons, or you can also get your name listed in the credits at the end of each episode. For more information, go to patreon.com slash astrology podcast. The main software we use here on the podcast to look at astrological charts is called Solar Fire for Windows, 
which is available at alabe.com, and you can use the promo code AP15 to get a 15% discount. For Mac users, we use a similar set of software by the same programming team called AstroGold for Mac OS, which is available from astrogold.io, and you can use the promo code ASTROPODCAST15 to get a 15% discount on that as well. If you would like to learn more about the approach to astrology that I outline on the podcast, then you should check out my book titled Hellenistic Astrology, The Study of Fate and Fortune where I traced the origins of Western astrology and reconstructed the original system that was developed about 2,000 years ago. And in this book, I outline basic concepts, but also take you into intermediate and advanced techniques for reading a birth chart, including some timing techniques. So you can find out more about the book at hellenisticastrology.com book. The book pairs very well with my online course on ancient astrology called the Hellenistic Astrology Course, which has over 100 hours of video lectures where I go into detail about teaching you how to read a birth chart and showing hundreds of example charts in order to really demonstrate how the techniques work in practice. So find out more information about that at theastrologyschool.com. Finally, special thanks to our sponsors, including The Mountain Astrologer magazine, available at mountainastrologer.com, and the Honeycomb Collective Personal Astrological Almanacs and Calendars, available at honeycomb.co.